role for mission into violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation of people with disability is now in session. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the third day of uh, Public Hearing 19 of the Royal Commission, dealing with the measures taken by employers and regulators to respond to the systemic barriers to open employment for people with disability. We commence by acknowledging the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation on whose traditional lands Commissioner Ryan and I are sitting. We also acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation upon whose lands Commissioner Galbali is sitting. I pay, or we pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. We also pay our respects to all First Nations people who are participating in or following this uh, hearing. Yes, Ms. Dalsey. Thank you, Commissioner. This morning, we begin with a panel on workplace adjustments, and you will hear witnesses from four of four employers, Accenture, RMIT, McDonald's and NAB. And uh, in respect of those parties, I note that RMIT wishes to announce. Yes, is there, is there a further appearance that has not previously been announced? More specifically, is there an appearance for RMIT? It seems to be on. Uh, that's... Yeah. It should just be coming up on the screen now. We don't seem to have anybody, any legal representative for RMIT appearing on the screen. So may I ask again whether there is any appearance to be announced on behalf of RMIT? If not, we might just proceed and uh, any appearance can be. I think he's trying to. Well, there's a head, there's a head that is appearing, yes. Uh, good morning, Chair. May it please the Commission, my name is Lachlan Carr, C-A-R-R, -R, and I appear for RMIT. Thank you, Mr Carr. You can remove your head now from the screen. Thank you. Yes, Ms Dowsett. Thank you, Chair. Begin by asking the witnesses to introduce themselves and beginning with Ms Kruger from Accenture. You are Sarah Kruger, the Australia and New Zealand Managing Director, Accenture Australia. Yes, that's correct. So I lead all people and culture related activities in Australia and New Zealand. Thank you. And you prepared a statement for this Royal Commission dated June 2021, a supplementary yes. statement dated the 27th of October 2021. Yes. and the corrigendum dated the 22nd of November, 2021. Yes. Do you have copies of those documents there with you today? Yes. And taken collectively, are they true and correct? Yes. And we see from your supplementary statement that as at the 25th of October, 2021, Accenture a HR system recorded 47 people who identify as a person with a disability? Yes, that number's now at 80, 81. And that's an increase from nine people as at the 24th of May 2021? Yes. Are you able to tell the Royal Commission why that number has increased? Are they new hires or just a change in the system? So they're not new hires. It, it was in May 2021 20, that we launched our ability for people to be able to identify as having a disability in Workday, which is our HR system. And what we've been doing is continuously running awareness campaigns and promotions, encouraging people to identify. So self-identification is, is voluntary. And so the uptake is about more people becoming aware of it and being more confident in being able to identify. Thank you. Uh, turning to you, Ms Marshall, you are Megan Marshall, the Chief People Officer, RMIT. That's correct. And you prepared a statement for this Royal Commission dated the 11th of June, 2021. Yes. 
and that statement is true and correct? That's correct. And as indicated by Ms Eastman in her opening on Monday, RMIT's HR system records 22 employees who identify as a person with a disability. Uh, that's Yes, that was in June. It's now up at 68. <laughs> and the same question for you as I asked of Ms Kruger. Are they new hires or a change in recording? Uh, we also launched the Workday system in June um, and since that time it's much easier for employees to self-identify mm. if they choose to. Thank you. Turning to you, Mr Carwood, you are Craig Carwood, Vice President and General Counsel of McDonald's Australia. Correct. You prepared a statement for this Royal Commission dated the 21st of June, 2021. And a supplementary statement dated the 25th of October, 2021. Yes. Taken together, are the contents of those statements true and correct? In her opening on Monday, Ms Eastman noted that McDonald's told us their HR system does not record the number of people with disability that it employs. That's correct, isn't it? It is correct. We have a system which uh, records or allows an applicant who we do hire at the start of their recruitment process to self-identify as to whether or not they have a disability and if so, what support they need. Uh, yes, I was coming to that. You've told us that in the period from January 2010 to December 2020, 6,214 candidates who were ultimately hired by McDonald's disclosed disability on their application form. That's correct. And in the period December 2020 to 9 June 2021, a further 1,498 candidates who were ultimately employed disclosed disability on their application form. That's correct. But you aren't able to say out of all of those people across more than a decade how many are currently employed by McDonald's. No, we're not. And when we're speaking of McDonald's in these figures, we're referring to both franchised restaurants and those operated by McDonald's itself? That's correct. Thank you. Uh, finally, turning to you, Ms Kasoglu. Uh, firstly, am I pronouncing that correctly? Yes, you are. Thank you. And you are and Androniki Kasoglu, Executive Culture, Engagement and Inclusion at NAV. That's correct. And you prepared a statement for this Royal Commission dated the 11th of June, 2021? That's correct. And the contents of that statement are true and correct? Yes. As with McDonald's, in relation to NAB, in her opening on Monday, Ms Eastman noted that your HR system doesn't record the number of people with disability. That's correct? That's correct. But in your statement, you noted that in 2020, 3.3% of NAB's permanent employees identify as a person with disability. That's correct. Are you able to provide a figure for employees other than permanent employees, so part-times and casuals? No, I'm not. Thank you. I'm going to turn now to the the focus of today's panel, this morning's panel, which is workplace adjustments. And commissioners, you will have noted that in the evidence a variety of terms are used. We have workplace adjustments, reasonable adjustments and reasonable accommodations. In this panel, when we talk about adjustments, I intend it to refer to all of those categories less concerned with what the label is and more concerned with what is done. So if I could start with you, Mr Carwood, the, the data that we have just spoken about, about the number of people ultimately hired by McDonald's who disclose disability on their application form indicates a, uh, a 
relatively high in terms of the employers who've given evidence to this Royal Commission, a relatively high participation rate. And you've noted that over the past decade, that participation rate is increasing. That's correct? That's correct. And yet you have no formal decision-making process for the making of adjustments and no policy to guide that decision-making process. Is that correct? We don't have no specific adjustment policy as such. We certainly have training and many policies of a more general nature that I think touch on those issues. Policies around inclusion, um, fairness, uh, and similar general policies like that. When we talk about our, you know, we're a large training organisation, McDonald's Australia is formerly an RTO. We provide thousands of hours of training each year. We certainly have specific policies around um, inclusion and adjustments, and each of those RTOs that do the training are specifically trained in making adjustments to ensure that the particular employees, no matter what their capabilities are, what additional support they need, are able to continue to learn through McDonald's and through our training. So in that space, we have very clear and a very focused area around adjustments. Um, but there are certainly many, many, many examples um, of adjustments that McDonald's makes to bring in to our employment um, people with disabilities. As I think you referred to before, we had almost 1,500 people in the last six months or in the first six months of this year that identified as having a disability. We asked them in that same recruit, online recruitment tool to identify what additional support they may need in order to carry out the normal tasks of their, their job. And in many cases, they identify what additional support they may need. But, um, yeah, that's, I, I guess, a fair response to that question. Thank you. So just to be clear, I'm not talking about your RTO, your registered training organisation side. I'm talking about uh, your employment side. So it, correct me if I'm wrong, but it is not the case that every employee of McDonald's goes through the RTO, is it? No, everyone has to. I'm sorry, I didn't catch the end of that. I so everyone, it, all of our employees have an opportunity to go through our RTA training. We you know, do thousands and thousands of hours each year. Um, many people with disabilities would go through that process, um, but not every employee does. Mr. Carwell, um, I'm told that... Uh, we, we're having uh, your voice is somewhat muffled. It's coming through very loudly, but it's somewhat muffled, and I'm told that it's probably your, at your end. I'm not sure whether anything can be done to uh, make your voice a little uh, less cloudy, as it were. Uh, I'll, I'll try and speak a little bit more clearly. Perhaps it could well be my voice rather than the system. No, I suspect it's the system. But anyway, yes. we'll carry on. The material that you provided to the Royal Commission in terms of the training that's provided to managers, to, to the people who are making the hiring decisions in restaurants, that training does not address the making of workplace adjustments, does it? No, but it certainly speaks of we have a, a, a respectful workplace policy that deals with inclusion and diversity. So it speaks to... Uh, you know, more general notions of, of, of you know, adjustments and the need to accommodate all people and to include all people in our workforce. Uh, but we, you're right, we don't have a specific policy or training to those managers that addresses workplace adjustments for those with disabilities that need it. So how does a restaurant manager come to know their legal obligations around making workplace adjustments? As I say, we, we, we've got a lot of more general training that uh, provides for that. We have a long history in providing um, opportunities for people with disabilities in our um, restaurants, both our corporate-owned restaurants, which we call Macopco restaurants, 
and our franchisee restaurants. The hiring decisions are made at the restaurant. We see that a lot of them do, in fact, make needed adjustments to bring um, into uh, our permanent people with disabilities. We believe that has made a positive impact on many of those people, and more importantly, they have made a positive and lasting impact on our organisation. There'd be rarely a restaurant, I think, in, in, in our system in Australia which doesn't have you know, a number of people with you know, disabilities working in it. And um, in many of those instances, there are workplace adjustments that have been made. Thank you, Mr Carwood. I'm going to move on for the moment while we see if we can do something about that yes, I, audio. I, I, I've been advised that if uh, we leave Mr Carwood just for the moment, he can stay there but not speak, then hopefully we'll be able to correct uh, the sound from your end, Mr Carwood. So just stay where you are and we'll just uh, ask questions of uh, other members of the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. So, Ms Marshall, turning to you and to RMIT, you say in your statement that RMIT takes a societal approach and that it is intended to be proactive and to remove the need for staff to make requests for adjustments. Does that accurately describe RMIT's position? Yes. And you've provided the Commission with a copy of RMIT's adjustments policy. Yes. And, Commissioners, you'll find that in Bundle B at tab 87. This adjustment policy is not limited to people with disability. That's correct, Ms Marshall? That's correct. It may be for people who have a you know, temporary illness or injury as well or other needs. And... It's also, it says in Section 1 context that it is for people who seek to balance their work, life and family needs. That's right, yes. So just to be clear, is that in relation to injury, illness and disability or is it work, life and family needs separate from those matters? It could be in relation to their illness or disability or it could be a standalone request for work, life and family needs we also have a flexible working policy as well that would cover um, other needs in relation to work life um, and working hours. And in that policy, in Section 1, again, Paragraph 3, it states that RMIT applies a criterion of reasonableness in all circumstances. Yes, that's correct. See that? And... Yes, the reasonableness of an adjustment is not the test under either the Disability Discrimination Act or the Equal Opportunity Act in Victoria. Would you agree with that? Uh, yes, I guess the, the way we look at it is whether it's a um, it's reasonable in the circumstances. So we would align with the Disability Discrimination Act in terms of our assessments. Um, we haven't um, rejected any requests for adjustment in the last two years, so we, we have accepted all requests that have come through. And you say at paragraph 10 of the policy that the university will provide an adjustment where staff experience illness, injury or disability that impacts upon their ability to safely undertake the inherent requirements of their job. That's correct. Can you tell the Royal Commission who identifies the inherent requirements of a job and when that happens? Uh, so at the, during the recruitment process um, and in the position description, we identify what are the inherent requirements of the role. And so that's done by the manager um, at the time of, you know, creating the role. And when are they communicated to employees? They're communicated at the recruit, time of recruitment or if there is a change um, to the role, they'd be communicated, consulted with, and then communicated to the employee at that time as well. And if you're only making adjustments where a disability impacts upon a person's ability to safely undertake the inherent requirements of their role, that's not consistent with taking a societal approach and being proactive, is it? 
I guess we, we take a first step is to be proactive in terms of our universal design principles and designing for dignity. So that's our first approach um, to look at our physical environment, to look at our technology and then look at our ways of working to remove any barriers that we've identified working with the Australian Network on Disability. Um, that's what we've been looking at to really remove some of those systemic um, barriers. And then we do consider all requests um, for adjustment, whether that's um, related to a person with disability or any other reason. Um, and as I said before, we haven't rejected any requests in the last two years. So the motivating factor for RMIT in its assessment of requests for adjustment it isn't just inherent requirements. Is that what you're telling the Royal Commission? Our motivating desire is to give employees a good experience um, and making sure that we've removed any barriers that we can um, for those employees to have full participation in our workforce. Would it be appropriate to amend paragraph 10 to provide that? Yes, thank you. I'll take that on notice as something we can look at. Yeah. Thank you. Ms. Kasoglu, turning to you now, you have also provided the Royal Commission with NAB's policies and a range of supporting documents. Yes, that's correct. But commissioners, for your information, you'll find those in bundle B at tabs 71, 72 and 73. I don't take you there right now. In your policy and supporting documents, um, NAB refers to adjustments as something which would allow a person to perform the inherent or essential requirements of their job safely, but you also refer to broader participation in the workplace. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And so what would you tell the Royal Commission is the motivating factor behind NAB's policy? The motivating factor behind NAB's policy is really to provide uh, an opportunity for all people with the skills and capabilities to undertake um, their roles uh, and to have equal opportunity uh, in being productive uh, and also progressing their careers. And in terms of progressing their careers, how do you know if you're meeting that goal, if you don't record whether people have a disability and you're not following them through the, the talent pipeline, if I can call it that? So we, we incorporate a question in our engagement survey on an annual basis that asks um, our, all our employees if they have a disability, yes and no, and if they uh, have requested an adjustment, yes or no, and then if, if their adjustment has been made, are they satisfied with that? And then we look at those results across our engagement uh, questions. So we look to see if there's any variation in how engaged um, people who identify with disability are uh, in relation to the rest of the population. And what does that survey tell you? Are they engaged? They are engaged in some pockets of the organisation. They are, they are just as engaged. In other pockets of the organisation, they are not as engaged. So it gives us an indication of, you know, what else we need to be doing. And what else are you doing? So we, we are provide information uh, and heat maps around these results to all our leaders uh, who have access to this, and then we encourage and support our leaders in having conversations around workplace adjustments and what yeah, else is required for employees to be um, productive and engaged in yeah, no. their day-to-day -day work. The supporting material that you've provided the Royal Commission that goes with NAB's policy refers to a best practice of a, a people leader having a conversation with team members every month to inquire if they need any adjustment to assist them to perform the, the tasks and requirements of their job. That's so correct. Firstly, a, a people leader, that's a, a supervisor or a manager, is that that's correct? That's correct, yes. And so if your best practice is to have that conversation monthly with every team member, do you know how often that best practice is met? No, I don't know the answer to that. 
Is that something that could be a KPI for your people leaders? Can you ask the question again, please? Well, I'll ask the question again, but I think you perhaps might need me to, to rephrase it. What I want to know is whether meeting this best practice of having a monthly conversation with every team member about whether they need an adjustment, if you made that a, a KPI or a performance indicator for your people leaders, could that improve your tracking against best practice? It could, but it would be very difficult for us to track that um, for every people leader uh, across NAB. Um, we do actually encourage our leaders through our all our leadership um, training as well as our performance management um, training that people have regular conversations with their employees around how they're tracking um, both from a goal perspective but also from a performance and what else we can do to support them. So those heat maps you were talking about before about pockets where people are feel they're not as engaged, yeah. do you think there's a correlation between the, the having or not having of these monthly conversations and the level of engagement? There could be, um, yes. Thank you. Turning to you now, Ms Kruger, um, Accenture has also provided the Royal Commission with its reasonable accommodations policy. Yes. And commissioners, for your information, that's at tab B3A. In that policy, Ms Kruger, Accenture says that refers to a reasonable accommodation as a modification that enables a person to perform work effectively. Yes. Should the Royal Commission take from that that Accenture takes a broader view that it doesn't see adjustments linked only to inherent requirements but to broader participation in the workplace? Yes, because our intent is that everybody is inclusive, included and able to work at their best. And is that intent stated in your policy? Yes, the intents are stated in our policies in terms of respecting the individual behaving professionally and some of those different types of policies. And so when a person in Accenture seeks a workplace adjustment, as I understand it from your evidence, there are a number of pathways. You could come through what's called the Disability Accommodation Request Tool. Yes. You could make a request through the Health, Safety and Wellbeing Team. Yes, yes. And you could also have an informal arrangement with your, your direct manager or supervisor. Yes, that's correct. Now, leaving aside the informal arrangement, who makes the decisions when a request is made through the DART or through the health, safety and wellbeing team? Our occupational health and wellbeing team, safety and wellbeing team makes that. We have clinical practitioners in that team who make those assessments, who help us make those assessments. And what training are those people given about their legal obligations in relate or Accenture's legal obligations in relation to workplace adjustments? So as a part of our employee relations team, they receive extensive on-the-job training and also access to external materials around that sort of thing, as well as a number of internal trainings that a lot of our employees undertake around codes of conduct and those sorts of things and, and specific training in relation to how they conduct those assessments and how they provide support. So are there guidance notes that sit behind Accenture's policies to guide this decision-making process? There is a process that the team follows, yes. And that process identifies the legal obligations? Yes, I think that's, that is called out in that. I'm sorry, I missed that. Yes, that is called out in that. Uh, 
I want to return to you now, Mr. Carwood. Hopefully we've fixed that IT issue. Perhaps we can just have a sound check. Uh, look, I hope so. It looks substantially better, so hopefully it sounds a little bit better. It's much better from this end. Thank Great. you very much. So in your statement, I'm, I'm turning now to the question of what adjustments cost and who pays. And in your statement at paragraph 93, you gave six illustrative examples of the kinds of adjustments that McDonald's has been asked to make. And you note that one of those involved no cost. Four, the costs were, quote, unknown. And in the final example, you noted that McDonald's paid the labour costs for some additional employee training. Correct. Firstly... Why are the costs unknown? Oh, they may have taken place a while ago where the record keeping in relation to those particular costs might be um, not readily available. They may have occurred uh, at a franchisee restaurant where we, at a corporate level, may not have visibility. 85% of our restaurants are owned and operated by local Australian franchisees. We're not um, yeah, we don't have access to all of those, their financial records. So they might be some of the reasons why the costs for those particular, you know, five examples are unknown to us at this point in time. Do you provide your franchisees with support in relation to how they might go about making adjustments, decisions and keeping records in relation to those decisions? Not specifically, like, like I, I sought to make the point earlier, we're really proud of uh, and we've got a long history in, in providing opportunities for people with disabilities in our restaurants. There's I real, guess. yeah, I, I, I think it's important to understand that the context in which this happens. We also, you know, review our franchisees' performance annually and biannually. And one of the measures that we you know, look to, both during the tenure of their long franchise agreement, it lasts for 20 years, is their support of, is their inclusive policies and practices, more practices than policies, but also more importantly, their commitment to the local community. It's one of the reasons we believe strongly in franchising and having a local operator that runs the business being responsible for things that are going on in their restaurant rather than someone head office a million miles away from what's actually going on in our restaurants. And I think... But doesn't, end, doesn't that create the issue, Mr Carwood, that you're heavily dependent upon the franchisees to do the right thing in this context in respect of uh, providing adjustments uh, for people with disability? Yes, uh, uh, of course we're heavily dependent on it. We, we recruit them very carefully. We strongly believe in them. We've got great uh, evidence. Uh, Mr. Mr. Carwood, you don't need to give us an advertisement. I understand that you think you run a very good operation. What I'm trying to work out is what are your policies and practices in relation to engaging people with disability, giving them support that is required under the law and any other, any other measures that are taken. At the moment, um, I'm not entirely clear what specific measures that McDonald's through the head office or however you describe it takes to ensure that uh, the conduct of franchisees in relation specifically to disability meets both legal requirements and aspirations that McDonald's uh, says that it wishes to achieve? Well, as I was trying to say, we, we review biannually and annually the commitment of our franchisees to various activities. Okay. How, how do you do that in relation to their practices as far as employing people with disability and providing adjustments to people with disability that may be required? We train them on one of their, their, their um, focuses needs to be their commitment to the community. Many of them, um, as part of that commitment to the local community, um, um, employ significant numbers of people with ha who have a disability. And in many instances, there's just five examples listed that um, council referred to of the adjustments that have in fact been made over the course of many years. Who selected, uh, that? Who selected those five, Mr Carwood? 
Uh, me and my team when we drafted the affidavit. Yeah, and where did you select them? How did you choose them? I would have spoken to, or my team would have spoken to a number of people that that are aware of those specific instances that are that, are, that have occurred in the course of our operations. May we take it you were looking for good examples? Of course. I think there are many, like, you know, there, there could be many more examples that we could had. Be. Yes. There could be if you kept records. That's true. All well, right. Thank uh, you. Uh, with respect, I think we do keep records. Every single person that is employed through our online platform identifies themselves if they have a disability. Yes, how many, do you keep records, Mr. Carwood, yes. of the adjustment of requests for adjustments, whether they have been made, whether they have been declined? Are those, we, do you have those records? We have records that are referred to and annexed in the affidavit of every single person that's hired who requested an adjustment. Every adjustment that's requested is recorded, is it? That's correct. All right. Well, that's uh, early. I. I can't recall which annexure, but that is recorded. That's just one way in which people come into the employment of McDonald's with a disability. The other, and, and that's the main way through our online smart recruiter platform. The other way is through the many um, uh, disability services providers that we use across the country. There would be many of them. We've had a long history with them. And they bring people to our restaurants that have disabilities that wish to work for us. Yeah. Thank and you, Mr. Carwood. Yeah, thanks, um, Mr. Carwood. I think we'll hand it back. I'm, right I'm going to stop you there. There's a whole, there's a different hearing next year that's going to deal with disability service providers. So we don't, disability employment service providers. We don't need to get into that. You were just referring the chair yeah. no, to the no, data. No, that um, the records that McDonald's keeps, and you've referred to those in your statement, just to clarify, um, they are annexures 18 and 19 you're referring to, uh, commissioners, you will find them tender bundle B58 and 59. These are, is it fair to say, Mr Carwood, very lengthy spreadsheets in which you have recorded the no. details no. of job applicants, um, de-identifying but keeping in where they have identified a disability and where they have identified a need for adjustment? Uh, not job applicants, job hires. Well, you get this information from their application form. But these are only people that have been hired. Yes. And so the, the question the chair asked you, and I'm not sure that you answered it clearly, is, is every accommodation requested in those spreadsheets, has every one of them been provided? What the spreadsheet provides is that everyone who hi we hired, who I self-identified as having a disability, and it asks them on the online platform what support they may require in order to carry out their jobs, their job tasks as identified in the application. So it records what they have said they need to be accommodated. Where do we find what McDonald's has done to address that request? I don't have that. And where do we find what requests have been made during the course of employment by employees for adjustments once they actually get on the job? I don't have that. That's the question I was asking you, Mr. Carwood. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Ms. Kasoglu, if we could move to you now. In your statement at paragraph 15, you have provided details of the average costs of different assessments that are carried out by NAB. Yes, that's correct. Is it safe to assume that following those assessments, some adjustments need to be made? Yes, that's correct. And you go on to say that if an adjustment costs more than $500, then an application might be made to the Employment Assistance Fund? Yes, that's correct. Does NAB have any records of adjustments that were made and how much they cost, whether or not they're paid for through the Employment Assistance Fund? 
We don't have records for what's been paid through the um, Employment Assistant Fund. Uh, we would have records of what is paid centrally, um, which is which um, is the uh, is the cap uh, where we do the initial assessment. So whatever is funded through centrally that we do, um, we would have figures on that. Uh, we don't have what what is expensed through the job access program. And you haven't included those details in your statement, but is that something that you are able to provide to the Royal Commission? Yes, that would be. And you've referred to central funding. Could you tell the Royal Commission what you meant by that? So the, the NAB's health and safety uh, management team who do the... Uh, the management of, I guess, any requests that come through, uh, they would do a, a, a very early intervention assessment um, in testing equipment um, or software or any type of um, requirement, and that cost associated with that is borne centrally through that uh, team. So if an employee needs a particular piece of software or some equipment, is it paid for by a, a central fund or is it paid for by the branch, the work area in which the employee works? So the assessment is paid centrally and the equipment uh, or the modification or whatever is required is paid by the business unit where the employee um, is situated and works. And that those records are kept about the cost of those where it's not employment assistance fund, it's paid for by the bank you have those records? We have the records of what, what costs we've, we've borne from the health and safety team in terms of undertaking the assessment. Um, I'm not sure if we have records around what every part of the business, any employee, what the cost of that modification would be um, as I'm not sure how that is tracked in, in line items um, across every part of the organisation. Is that a question you can take on notice and come back to us about how you track it and where that information might be? Yes. Thank you. Turning to you, Ms Marshall, in RMIT's statement, you didn't say anything about the cost of adjustments. Is that information that RMIT captures? Um, we've kept, we've tracked the cost of our physical building um, adjustments. So that's we've spent $3.6 million over the past five years um, through our property improvement program. Um, we don't keep a central record of the other adjustment costs because we find the majority of requests are actually in relation to flexible work. Um, or the property um, changes we've, worried, uh, we've identified in our statement. So to be clear, flexible work wouldn't have a cost and that's why you don't track the cost of that's it. That's correct. Yeah. And you do refer in your statement, as you did in your answer just then, to um, some requests that are made for adjustments. Um, sorry, I'll, I'll begin again. In your statement, you've referred to an increase in requests for adjustment from 2020, and these were around, if I can put it broadly, working from home. That's correct. And that reflects public health orders that were in place in Victoria as a result of COVID-19. That's correct. And through, through that process, um, we asked all of our employees to submit um, a working from home form to identify if they had any specific adjustments that were required or any specific needs. Um, and through that, we conducted um, online ergonomic assessments and set up for our employees who required that. Um, and we also couriered, you know, equipment um, to staff who needed at home. So we couriered over 900 ergonomic chairs um, home to people last year um, so that they had the right equipment at home as well as screens and other hardware depending on the needs um, that they identified. And we see from your statement that that's almost your entire workforce. I think it's 6,000-odd of those adjustments. Yep. So let's put aside those ergonomic adjustments that we can call the work-from-home adjustments. What else, what other types of adjustments is RMIT asked for? You've, you've told us about flexibility with no cost, the work-from-home adjustments. Is there anything else? 
Uh, so we get we ask get us for justice in terms of communication. Um, so preferred communication methods. Um, so some staff may request um, emails as a preferred communication method or particular technology um, that assists them um, to engage. So we, where we can, we attempt to we try to provide that as a default um, for all staff. So where there's you know translation services, there's recording, there's captioning, um, all those different technologies we've actually brought in in the last couple of years that we've we're addressing the majority of the technology requirements we were also getting through. So we've done a lot of work in the technology and digital accessibility space. And when you say um, for all employees, so that's a global that's change. Correct. Are there any changes of that kind or any other types of adjustments that are made for a particular person? That's great. So in the last, uh, through 2020 and 2021, we've had, I believe, 30 um, adjustments have referenced disability um, specifically that weren't able to be accommodated through our, um, you know, our digital accessibility, our premises, um, so specific requests. Um, usually that was for a specific type of technology um, or that was required for that individual. And when you say they weren't able to be accommodated, is that at all or just in, a in that global element? Approach? Yeah, so we obviously we're trying to as much as possible make these proactive um, so our staff don't even have to ask. That's what we're attempting to do, but there inevitably will be occasions where we have to look at a particular technology or a new um, support um, for employees where there's a specific need that we haven't been able to accommodate in our universal approach. Um, so sticking with the theme of cost just for the moment, were, were there any that were able to be provided and where would we find the cost of those? Um, we've provided everything that's been asked for um, in the last sort of two years that I've got reporting for. The cost, some would be um, handled centrally. So where, where we can, again, if there's a request to update a system or provide a technology, we'll try and make that available universally. Um, so that's how we do approach it. Is it something that will be beneficial to other employees um, and bring that in? So it would be the cost will be spread across um, the central team, the property team, and then our IT um, resources as well. I don't, I don't have that specific figure for the technology changes. The property I do, um, but technology, I could take that and notice and see what I can find in terms of the costs for that. Just to clarify, I thought you said in an answer a moment ago there were 30 occasions where you couldn't provide the adjustment and then you no, just sorry, said please. we've provided everything we've been asked for. No, sorry, there was 30 specific adjustment requests and we approved all of those. Right. Yep, sorry. Thank you. I know it's important to be clear yeah. about that. And those 30 adjustment requests, you can provide us with the cost for those? Some of them may not have a cost depending on the nature, but I can take that on notice to come back with um, information. Thank you. Uh, turning to you, Ms Kruger, in your supplementary statement, you've advised the average cost of adjustments provided through the disability accommodation request tool as $1,726. I think that number might be wrong. Do you recall the number? $1,057.54. And that was for 14 adjustments? That was the average cost, yes. yes. But averaged over 14 adjustments. Yes, and there's been more adjustments since then. So we've now had 28 adjustments. And does the average cost still fall below $2,000? Generally speaking, yes. So the average and, does, yes, yes. And we spoke about other pathways to getting an adjustment through Accenture, and one of those was the health, safety and wellbeing team. Do you capture the cost of accommodations provided that way? Yes, and that average refers to the accommodations provided by them. So whether it comes to them via the DART tool or to that team through other sources, either HR business partners or um, requests or things like that, that's what that cost relates to. And it is recorded in a, um, a case management tool. So in your supplementary statement, um, in so this is on page four in the paragraph that's been renumbered through the core agenda to refer to paragraph 15, subparagraph C. 
you give the figure of $1,726.40 as the average cost of accommodation provided through the DART. Is that not correct? Is it the average cost of accommodation provided through any pathway? Yes, yeah, sorry, that is the up-to-date figure. I was looking at the one from May. So that but is in the, terms of... It was through the pathways that come into the health, safety and wellbeing team, so whether that comes to them through the DART or another source. Right. Thank you for that. And just to confirm... The other pathway was that informal arrangement, and again, they would be no cost or relatively low cost. Relatively low cost, and as others have indicated, a things like flexible work arrangements and things like that aren't necessarily understood the same way. And where the cost is paid by Accenture, is it paid from a central fund or through the work area where the person is employed? It's paid internally through the health and safety team, costs are applied out to different parts of the business through sort of a below-the-line allocation, so it's not specifically to that employee. And you go on in your statement to say that, uh, moving on, sorry, to a topic about adjustments that are not provided. So there's been a request, but you've not been able to provide it. Ms Kruger, you say for Accenture that they, an adjustment would not be provided if an assessment indicated it wasn't required or if it wasn't reasonably practicable to provide it. Yes, that's correct. So as to the first one, a person comes to Accenture and says, I request this adjustment, you undertake an assessment and it says no adjustment required, that it's not provided? Yes, it's probably worth noting that there have been no requests rejected. So we have provided adjustments and paid for those wherever they've been requested with the information that's recorded. And just picking up on the second reason that you've given, not reasonably practicable, that, that's the other reason you said an adjustment might not be provided. Yes, that's correct. Do you appreciate that's not the test under the legislation? Um, I'd need to check into that. I, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so perhaps if you can take that on notice and see if that is in fact Accenture's policy to not provide where it's not reasonably practicable and provide us with uh, that in writing. Yep. And uh, turning to you, Ms Kasoglu, uh, you say in paragraph 16 of your statement that um, NAB would not provide an adjustment where to do so would cause unjustifiable hardship and that alternatives would be considered and discussed. That's correct. Are you aware of any occasion when an adjustment is not provided and an alternative has not been able to be identified? No, I'm not. Uh, Mr Carwood, if we could come to you next. Uh, you've told us in paragraph 89 of your statement that where an adjustment is easily implemented, a decision will be made to approve the adjustment. Correct. Coming back to, to where we began this morning about not having a policy, how do restaurant managers know that whether or not something can be easily implemented is not the statutory test? Uh, I have no policy about that. You have no policy about how restaurant managers can know what the test is? No, I have nothing to point you to apart from, as I said before, we have general policies and training that deal with a lot of these things. Our restaurant managers and hiring managers, as well as, well as their consultants, in many cases our franchisees, are well versed in um, accommodating uh, people with disabilities and making many adjustments. Most of them quite easily are accommodated 
Some require more substantial um, adjustments, but in many cases, they can be easily accommodated. And in fact, they are. They might be um, you know, more support on the shift. It might be um, a limit on where they work in the restaurant, whether it be the front of the house in a customer service role um, or other restrictions in terms of lifting um, or moving around the restaurant. But those adjustments are you know, very easily made, very easily accommodated, and as I say, are best made by the people who are operating the restaurants themselves. The question, though, Mr Carwood, is, is not what McDonald's has, has managed to achieve because, a, as you keep saying, you've got a number of employees who identify as a person with a disability and they identify in their application form that they need adjustments. What I'm seeking to explore is what guidance McDonald's gives to these decision makers to help them make that decision. Are we there by dumb luck or are you training them about what to do? Well, I think it's more than dumb luck. I think our experience has demonstrated that we are actually doing. So in real life, there are thousands of people working in our organisation that have disabilities. And we know thousands of them have made small or significant adjustments to their workplace experience. And we know that through our annual engagement survey process, that the vast majority, the overwhelming majority of our employees say that they have the resources to do their job and their manager supports them to do it. So I don't have a policy that I can point to, but I can in fact point to these things actually happening in real life and making a difference to the people and making a difference to our organisation. It works both ways. Thank you. Now, you do say in your statement that you're not aware of any occasion on which an adjustment was requested and not provided. I'm not aware, no. And you also, in your statement at paragraph 132, um, provided some information about themes of complaints that McDonald's has received. Yes. And one of those themes is around adjustments. Yes. You see that on page 29 of the statement. I do. Does it follow from your answer that you're not aware of any occasion when an adjustment hasn't been provided that for each of these examples you've given at paragraph 132, the adjustment was provided? Uh, no, I, I can't categorically say whether the adjustment was or wasn't provided in those examples. What inquiries did you make for the purpose of giving the answer to say that you weren't aware of any instance when an adjustment wasn't provided? I've spoken to a, new, a number of people and my team who assisted me in preparing for this affidavit and the hearing today, a number of people that have got experience in these areas. These were some of the examples. And, and again, I, I emphasise most of these go are going to be for employees that aren't directly employed by us. So I don't necessarily have those records. I need to speak to others who have got the employment relationship with. 85% of those employees working in a McDonald's restaurant are engaged on an employment basis with the local franchisee. So I've made inquiries and my team have made inquiries to provide as best we can those examples we have a, um, a platform, an online platform called CARE that records complaints received. Um, a number of these complaints would have been identified through examining that CARE um, database. And is the CARE database anonymous? Uh, no, it, it, it would record... Um, it would record who the complainant was unless they've specifically chosen to remain anonymous. So you have an option to not disclose who's making the complaint or the inquiry. Many of the issues that are logged in the care database are more inquiries rather than complaints. Some are complaints, but there is an option as to whether or not the, the provider of the information discloses who they are or not. So just to be clear, the contents of the adjustment theme in paragraph 32, did, did that come from the CARE database? Uh, 
I can't say that all of it came from the CARE database. I'd imagine we saw some of that information from the CARE database. And did you, are you able to say whether the ones that were sourced from the CARE database were anonymous or not? I don't know. And does it follow that you also don't know or didn't make any inquiries about what came of these complaints? Yeah, I, I don't know that the resolution of those complaints is set out in the care database, but I don't know what came of these issues. Do you think that would have been a relevant inquiry to make in light of the answer, the statement you made at paragraph 96 that you weren't aware of any adjustments that had not been provided and weren't able to identify any examples? Oh, we, we made our best endeavours to provide a fulsome answer to every inquiry that was made of us. This represents our best efforts to do that. Um, you know, yes, of course, we, you know, I possibly could have um, gone further, but these were our, our best attempts to provide a full answer to all of the questions. Would your capacity to provide this information have been assisted by better data, better record keeping? Of course. And do you think that's something that McDonald's would be prepared to take on board to change or to, in fact, to start keeping these records? I think there's certainly an opportunity that I have personally experienced through preparing for today's hearing and preparing the affidavit that there's a opportunity um, that should well be explored about how to record um, a lot of the information that you've referred to today, yes. Uh, now, Ms Marshall, you gave your answer to this topic on the way through, but just to confirm, it's RMIT's position that it's not aware of any circumstance in which a person asked for a reasonable adjustment and it wasn't provided. That's correct. Ms Marshall, I notice uh, that uh, you've been in your position for three months um, and your position has the title Chief People Officer. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. Was there a predecessor or are you the first person to hold that position? Uh, there was a predecessor, but I have actually been with RMIT for three years. Um, in a, I was in another role before this, yes. But were you uh, in the, this section that uh, is the subject of your statement? Yes, I was the Director of HR Business Partnering, so I was in the people team, yes. Yes, thank you. Now, Ms Kisoglu, I want to come back to you and ask you about uh, the, the topic that you raise in paragraph 15 and, six, 15 and 17, sorry, of your statement, and that's the, the question of mental health. And you um, observe that it is perhaps a, an area of increasing referral and increasing um, numbers of employees seeking assistance in this regard. Yes, that's correct. And what I'd like to explore with you and then with the rest of the panel is what you do, what you're able to do at NAB to support um, employees with, with a mental health concern or perhaps a psychosocial concern in the workplace, specifically in terms of adjustments? So the way we have um, approached this is obviously through awareness and education. Um, as we've seen the shift in um, a lot more pe people coming to work, uh, and whether it's a personal uh, issue or it's a work-related um, issue, um, it's affecting their ability to perform their roles because of anxiety or stress. Um, it sort of impacts, and we position it as the psychological safety or ability to speak up. And I guess what we've been doing is trying to educate both our leaders and our colleagues around um, what is available by way of support for them, um, whether it's a third party through our employee assistance program um, provider uh, that they can get specialised um, and private and confidential sort of counselling, or whether it's actually um, requesting um, support from their leader 
um, that they're actually struggling with something and, and need either uh, an intervention or an adjustment uh, to be made uh, as part of the work that they're doing. So it goes back to what was raised before around um, what type of an adjustment can be offered and in most situations around uh, the mental mental well-being of people, it's time out, it's flexible working, it's looking at the type of role that they're in and, and looking to see what we can do to adjust, I guess, levels of responsibility that impact on uh, their mental, mental state. Um, and during those conversations, it's always about um, empowering the leader to have those difficult conversations and to be aware of um, what, what, what we can do to support um, this colleague or this employee remain employed, but also give them the time they need to recuperate. And the, the assessments that we're talking about here, these are early intervention assessments. That's Correct. The, the category in your statement. Correct. And you've recorded that in the period 1 October 2019 to 20 May 2021, there were 280 of these assessments. Correct. So they've, they've been sort of tracked um, or logged from an incident sort of report. So when something happens to somebody um, and there's a sort of requirement uh, for a discussion or, a, or something to change, um, they're recorded through um, as an early intervention. And do you keep track of the, the something that changes? Have you got statistics about the adjustments that or modifications that are being made? Yes, we would have uh, because there are options in relation to whether it, um, in terms of it, is it is it an adjustment to their work, is to the work pattern, um, to their role, um, or is it just time out? So we would be sort of tracking what type of a assessment or adjustment is required. Yes. Thank you. Uh, turning to you, Ms. Kruger. Uh, firstly, is is the experience at NAB of um, seeing an increase in these issues, something that's reflected in your organisation? Yes. And are you able to tell the Royal Commission what it is that Accenture is able to do to provide accommodations or support in this area? So there's a number of things that we can do, one of which is flexible work arrangements, working we're relevant with medical practitioners and external advisors to provide the right setup, whether that includes time away, part-time arrangements, different working arrangements to put the right structures. It may include moving people to a different part of the business or to a different role that helps them address the challenges that they were facing. Uh, next to you, Mr Carwood, is, is this issue something that you have observed or something that McDonald's has observed, an increase in mental health issues? I don't have any you know, empirical data that points me in that direction, but I, I, I you know, very easily accept that anecdotally there seems to be, you know, it's, it's not an infrequent issue that arises in our workplace, certainly you know, mental health around anxiety um, is uh, an issue that we see from time to time for sure. And again, it would be up to the restaurant managers to uh, work out what adjustments could be made to accommodate somebody in those circumstances. I think there's, there's information that we provide um, to all employees um, about mental health, how to deal with it, how to manage it. We certainly have an employee hotline that any employee or manager can call to get assistance in dealing with those issues for their own um, health or for someone under their direct supervision. We also have an employment um, assistance program, which is a third party provider um, that we pay for that um, can provide counselling support to any of our employees. They dial up the line and get that independent um, um, you know, no record to us, but, um, you know, get the support. So there are programs um, uh, that are available to employees and to managers around the country, yes. And finally to you, Ms Marshall, is is it something that RMIT has observed, the, an, an increase in employees needing support for mental health issues? 
Yes, we have. And are you able to tell the Royal Commission about what you're able to do in your workplace to, to support and accommodate those people or if there are circumstances where there's not something that you're able to do? Um, yeah, I guess so similar to um, the other um, panellists, we have a free um, counselling service, confidential counselling service for our employees and their families. Um, we also have a manager assist um, counselling support service where there's some coaching for managers who have employees who may have a mental um, illness. We also have you know, regular training and awareness for our staff and managers in relation to mental um, wellbeing. And uh, similar to NAB, we also have an early intervention um, team and our health, self health safety and wellbeing team um, who will support employees um, through any um, mental illness that they're suffering. And we look at then what adjustments are required based on medical advice, um, looking at you know, flexible work, job design, um, et cetera. So, and I'm not aware of any um, cases where we haven't accommodated requests. Thank you very much. I have no further questions for the panel. I'm going to hand you to the commissioners now. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll ask uh, Commissioner Gelbley, um, who I, if you don't already realise, is in Melbourne. I'll ask Commissioner Gelbley if she has any questions. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, I'm, I'm interested to ask particularly... Um, RMIT, Ms Marshall and Mr Haywood about what sounds like a universal, in fact, you used the word, Ms Marshall, a universal approach to adjustments to complement um, the individual um, approach. And I wondered if you could start in outlining what you mean by that, a universal approach to reasonable adjustment for people with disabilities. Thank you. Um, so the approach that RMIT has taken over the last five years, and this has been um, heavily informed by the Australian Network on Disability, is to really, we we'll call it design for dignity, so a universal design approach um, where we look at our you know, systems, our technology, our ways of working, our physical environment, um, and proactively um, remove barriers or um, any areas where we see there may be um, accessibility issues. Um, and that's the approach we've taken. So we've been looking at you know, things from a more enterprise level approach rather than um, looking for employees to individually request um, adjustments. So you're trying to almost make the whole environment as accessible as possible, and that also means workplace flexibility and um, work, working from home policy, yeah. And, Mr Kaywood, I mean, I'm, I'm going back a long way in terms of McDonald's um, decision quite a long time ago to employ people with disabilities and your long involvement in that. So your approach to workplace adjustment sounds also that you're trying to make every, you know, the whole culture universally um, inclusive. Is that the case? Yeah, I, I don't think I specifically spoke about a universal approach or an individual approach. We certainly um, have an individual approach at a restaurant dealing with particular employees and what they say or their carers or supporters or the disability service provider, you know, we work with. And it's not just work with at the start of their employment. In, you know, many instances, it's a journey. It's a, you know, throughout their entire employment journey with us, which in many instances is many, many years, there, um, there's an ongoing process around it is what we're doing sufficient? Is it working for both parties and continuing to evolve that throughout the journey of their employment? Um, there are, of course, though, again, while not referring to it before, there are, of course, system things that we have done. And I think council assisting has highlighted some opportunities that I think we have as well that you know can be done and probably should be done. Um, but in terms of... Um, you know, recruitment, which is, I think, a really important focus of the Commission today, you know, we have moved from a previous provider of online recruitment services, which was a online process that took th about 36 minutes to complete. It was heavily word-based and you needed a certain level of comprehension and, you know, oral and, 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 and written skills to complete it. And the assessment was done largely on your ability to answer those questions in writing. We have now moved to an, a new online platform from December 2020, which only takes three minutes to complete, 
which has been designed in a way that removes some of those or lowers some of those barriers to some people with accessibility. So that's, I guess, one example of a more universal or more system-wide approach that's trying to address some of those important barriers that might exist at that important time of entering the workforce or entering our employment. Thank you. Commissioner Wright. Um, a question to everybody except the representative from NAB because you did actually mention this, but I was wondering in terms of when you were responding to the Commission's request about the costs um, and covering the costs of employment adjustments, none of you referred to the Commonwealth Employee Assistance Funding Program, which is a program designed to offset those costs. Is it because that that program is not well known or you don't use it or it's difficult to use? provide an answer on behalf of RMIT. We, we haven't um, accessed that because we haven't um, needed to at this point in time as a large employer. Mr Carwood, if I could ask you to go next. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, we've set out in, a, in, in my statement that we don't currently access the fund. I can't honestly provide a, a, a direct answer to why we don't, whether we don't need to or you know, the organisation as a whole, including our franchisees, aren't cognisant of it, but we don't, um, as far as I can ascertain, access the fund at the moment. And Ms Kruger? Uh, no, we haven't accessed the fund at this point in time as we haven't found a need to. Um, um, this, um, Sorry, um, Mr. Carwood, look, I was just going to clarify something you'd said earlier. Um, in your statement, you make the statement, McDonald's does not retain a centralised database recording the number of employment adjustments requested and provided to people with disabilities. And then in some of your evidence, you indicated that you did have a record. Could you clarify the different what you meant, given that there seems to be a difference between those two statements? Yeah, of course. So when... People ent so there are two principal ways um, people enter our workforce, either working directly for McDonald's Australia Limited or working for one of the 230-odd you know, franchisee um, companies that operate McDonald's restaurants. The, most, uh, the, 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 the biggest way in which they uh, enter our workforce is entering through our current online recruitment platform, which is called Smart Recruiters. As part of that application process, we record, uh, we ask them a question that, you know, I'll, I'll paraphrase, simply says your, you know, your job is likely to include lifting, twisting, bending, working at pace uh, and talking to customers. Do you have a disability that would prevent or limit or restrict you in doing some of those activities? If so, what adjustment or support do you need to do, do you need to have in order to perform those tasks? We record for everyone that is hired through that platform the response to those questions and we retain that information. There are, um, um, so from 2020, December 2020, that information is recorded for every single person we hire uh, through that online platform. Previously, there was another online platform called Workstar that effectively did, did the same thing and effectively asked the same question. There is another avenue with people with more, let me say, that might require more substantial assistance that often come to us through a disability service provider. I don't have a national database that records what adjustments are made for those individuals that don't enter through the online platform, but enter through the support provided by, or the services provided by that disability support uh, service provider. Those adjustments tend to be more substantial in nature, more ongoing in nature, um, but I don't have a national database of them. And I think as the, the, the chair previously identified, if adjustments are made post-recruitment, I don't have a database that records at a national level those adjustments. I hope that clarifies it. The way in which you ask the question about adjustments of recruitment in that you indicate a number of things people might be required to do. 
do you think that there's a risk that they might actually put people with disabilities off, that they might say, if I have to do all of these things, I can't work for McDonald's, even though you do offer adjustment? If you didn't have high level of literacy um, in what adjustment meant, you might think that that was, in fact, um, you know, an indication that you can't work at McDonald's. Um, well, yeah, perhaps, and I'm, I'm happy to, you know, the organisation is open to ongoing feedback around all of our recruitment processes, particularly in this critical area. Referring specifically to the question, it says some of the key responsibilities that you may be asked to perform include lifting, twisting, working at pace and talking to customers. They are typically what an ordinary you know, worker in our restaurants would be asked to do. And then it goes on to say, do you have a disability or health condition which would prevent you from performing some or all of these tasks? If so, please explain the disability and what support may be required to assist you in performing the role. So I think that I, 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 I believe it's written in a way that is trying to be inclusive and trying to indicate our support for those people that may have limits or restrictions on some of their um, you know, activities and movements. I'd also emphasise that what we do have is a lot of people that do get employed um, that do, in fact, have a disability and do, in fact, respond positively positively to those questions and then the feedback of those that are employed through our uh, engagement um, process each year indicate that they are well supported by the system and by their managers so you know, yes of course we could reflect on some of those questions and perhaps ask them in a more inclusive kind of way but I think it tries to address those issues. Final thing I'd like when you take on a new franchisee what sort of briefing do you give them about their legal obligations? I mean, for example, do you brief them on perhaps the local requirements for work, health and safety? And do you make any reference to the Disability Discrimination Act and its implications on employment? Yeah, the training involved for many of our you know, um, new franchisees is a lengthy process. It typically takes you know, over a year for someone um, to go through our training courses. They are trained on all aspects of running a business, they are a separate legal entity. They are their own employing entity who have their own obligations. We typically are, yeah, attract people that are well-versed in running a business and know full well what those legal op yeah, obligations Mr. are. Carl, we're going to be limited by time. I really didn't need you to go into the detail. I think the answer to, you? I think the answer to Commissioner Ryan's question is no, judging from your Do, do you brief them on their legal obligations? <laughs> Uh, we we talk to them about a range of things, including many legal obligations. Uh, I think say, the, the question the, was, do you talk to them, do you train them in the requirements of the Disability Discrimination Act? I would have thought the answer to that is either yes or no. I, I can't answer that question Thank specifically. You. All right, well, thank you. Um, can I ask, please, Ms Kruger, I noticed that at page seven of uh, your statement on behalf of uh, Accenture, you indicate that there is a disability recruitment target of 8.7% by 2022. As I recall your evidence, um, I think you indicated that you now had 81 people who self-identified as people with disability out of a workforce of 6,335, which is roughly 1.4%. Uh, it seems like a rather big jump from 1.4% to 8.7% by 2022. How, how is this going to be achieved? This is going to be a challenge for us because of the self-identification. So that 81 relates to all of our employees and around self-identification. We're actually going through a process in relation to being a disability um, recruiter and looking at questions in that process to help identify individuals as they're coming in through the recruitment channels to identify as having a disability and whether or not they need support or assistance as a part of that. I'm not sure I understand the answer. Do, is, 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 are you indicating that you think you've already got more than 1.4% and you'll be able to boost that percentage by uh, 
getting some further information from employees or is there a particular program you intend to implement? I'm not quite clear. We are looking at programs we to implement to encourage more people to identify because it is voluntary self-identification. That's the challenge that we face. We do believe that there's more people within the workforce that have disabilities that have not identified. All right, thank you. And uh, if I can ask uh, Ms. Kasoglu, um, you indicate at page four, I think paragraph five of your statement, that NAB does not have currently, currently have targets for recruiting, promoting or retaining employees with disability, but uh, you refer to a range of policies. Is that because a target has been considered and rejected or because NAB has not directed attention to whether there ought to be targets? It's, the answer is the latter. Um... Our focus has really been um, on inclusion and uh, accessibility and adjustments much more so than um, specifically highlighting people with disability. Um, so it's not because we have put that up and it's not something uh, that we've just not discussed that as a... Uh, as having, a regard, having regard to the practices of other large employers, do you think there might be some merit in uh, at least considering whether that is a worthwhile initiative? Yes, and and we will consider it, uh, but we're quite keen to make sure that we can uh, track and monitor um, this through our HR system first. So as we transition to a new modern uh, workday uh, system, we will build capability in doing that. And so we'll be in a better position to be able to then set or consider some targets and goals. Thank you. Now, I understand uh, that uh, Mr. Carr, who appears for Ms. Marshall, wishes to ask uh, some questions. Perhaps, uh, Mr. Carr, you could indicate why you wish to ask some questions. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, subject to leave being granted in accordance with the practice guidelines, I'd like to ask Ms. Marshall five questions. They are all related uh, and they concern the questioning that was made of her in relation to universal adjustments and then specific adjustments made by uh, requests for adjustments made by people in addition to those universal adjustments i just felt there was a point of clarification to be made yes, on, if, on if, if if you want to ask questions designed to clarify uh, you can do that i'd ask you to be as brief as possible and for ms marshall to keep her answers as brief as possible uh, bearing in mind we have time constraints and many parties are represented. So go ahead. Absolutely, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Ms Marshall, I direct your attention to the answers given by you to questions put by Council Assisting, as well as um, matters stated by you in your statement relating to the universal adjustments that RMIT makes for all staff. Uh, is it the case that people who require adjustments do not, in many cases, need to ask for adjustments because they've already been made for everyone at RMIT? Correct. And during the past two years, is it true that approximately 30 people required adjustments above and beyond those universal adjustments? That's correct. And were those 30 requested adjustments provided by RMIT? They were all provided. And in the past two years, to your knowledge, has any request for an adjustment been declined by RMIT? No, not to my knowledge. Is it true to say that in the past two years, all requests for adjustments made of RMIT were accepted by RMIT and those adjustments were made? That's correct. Thank you, Ms Marshall, and thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr Carr. I love, I love non-leading questions, uh, to clarify. <laughs> I assume that nobody else who's represented has any questions to ask of members of the panel, in which case I thank everybody who has uh, appeared, the uh, five representatives today. We thank you for the statements that you have provided and the oral evidence that you have provided today. And if I may express the hope uh, that uh, at least uh, some of the members of the panel who've uh, said that they will consider some issues from the point of view of their organisations, that that will in fact uh, happen. Thank you very much. Should we now take a break?
Just, if I may, Chair, do the tender before oh, the we tender, break. Yes. Have I got a list? I'm about to be given a list, I think. Yes, go ahead, Ms. Nelson. Uh, so, firstly, Chair, I'd like to pick up with the attachments to the statement for Michael Nelson. So, Mr. Nelson's statement was tendered yesterday as Exhibit 19-15. The attachments, as indicated on the schedule you've been passed, will become 19-15.1 through to 19-15.14. Yes. The statement of Mr Carwood dated the 21st of June 2021 will be 19-16, together with annexures at 19.16.1 to 19 dash 16.5. Yes. The statement of Ms Kisoglu dated the 11th of June 2021 will be 19-17 with attachments 19-17.1 through to 19-17.11. The statement of Ms Kruger dated the 18th of June 2021 will be Exhibit 19-18, together with attachments 19-18.1 through to 19-18.6. And the statement of Ms Marshall, dated the 11th of June 2021, will be, we propose, Exhibit 19-19 with attachments 19-19.1 through to 19-19.8. Yes, yeah, thank you. All of the documents uh, to which Ms. Dowsett has referred will be admitted into evidence and given the ex exhibit number she has indicated. All of this is recorded in the document that I have and I will initial and date uh, today. Thank you very much. So it's now uh, just after 11.30. Shall we resume at 11.50? If please, the Chair. Thank you. The Royal Commission is adjourned. The Royal Commission is resumed. Yes. Uh, thank you, Ms. Dalson. Thank you, Chair. In the next panel, we're going to continue our focus on workplace adjustments, but this time we're going to look at it from the perspective of the Australian Public Service through three witnesses representing the Australian Tax Office, the Department of Social Security and the National Disability Insurance Agency. <coughs> I think we have uh, everybody on the screen. Thank you very much uh, for attending the Royal Commission uh, to give uh, evidence. We appreciate your assistance. Just so you know where we are all located, Commissioner Galbally is joining this hearing from Melbourne. I am in the Sydney hearing room together with uh, Commissioner Ryan on my right, and Ms Dowsett, uh, Council assisting the Royal Commission, is also in the Sydney hearing room. And I will now ask Ms. Council, Ms. Dowsett, to ask you some questions. Thank you, Chair. In her opening on Monday morning, Ms. Eastman noted that the percentage of people with disability recorded in the HR system across the Australian Public Service as a whole is 4%. The representative, the agencies and departments represented here today do slightly better than that, and I will give you their statistics as I introduce each witness. Firstly, if I could begin with you, Mr Chapman. You are Bradley Chapman, Deputy Commissioner, ATO People. That's correct. And you have provided a statement to this Royal Commission dated the 27th of October, 2021. Uh, yes, that is, that is correct. And in that statement, you have adopted the statement prepared by Mr. Liam Page, Assistant Commissioner, Workforce Strategy, dated the 18th of June 2021. Uh, yes, correct. And do you also adopt his corrigendum of the 17th of November 2021? Uh, yes, that's correct. I, I actually signed that uh, that and myself. Commissioners, for your information, those statements are in bundle C at tab 8, 
eight A and eight seven and eight A. Taken together, Mr. Chapman, are the contents of those statements true and correct? Uh, yes, they are. And we see from your statement that as at the most recent figures recorded in the HR system for the Australian Tax Office have the participation of people with disability at 4.6%. That's correct? That, that is correct. And in the most recent APS census, the Australian Taxation Office recorded 1,126 employees with a permanent disability or 8.9%. Is that correct? Uh, yes, that is correct. Thank you. Uh, turning to you, Mr Hudson. You are Adrian Hudson, Chief Operating Officer and Deputy Secretary of the Department of Social Security. Uh, Social the Department Services. of Social Services. Yes, that's correct. Thank you, and my apologies. You have prepared a statement dated the 18th of June, 2021. Yes, that's correct and a corrigendum dated the 20th of October, 2021. Yes, that's correct. And taken together, the contents of those statements are true and correct? Yes, they are. As to participation rate, the HR system records DSS as having a 7.2% of its staff identify as a person with disability. So that was correct at the time of the statement. We now have updated data, if that would be useful. Uh, yes. What can you tell the Royal Commission? So the current rate is 6.6% as at 30 September. 6.6%? Correct. And in the 2021 census, it was 254 employees or 12.1%. That's correct. And then turning to you, Mr Aikman, you are Hamish Aikman, Chief People Officer, National Disability Insurance Agency? Yes, that's correct. And you provided a statement to the Royal Commission dated the 23rd of June, 2021? Yes. And that statement is true and correct? It is. As to participation level... As at the 30th of March, 2021, your HR system recorded 11.44% employees identifying as a person with a disability at the APS level. Yes. And 8.5% at the senior executive service level. Yes. And in the 2021 survey, a record of 684 employees or 17.2% of employees identified as a person with disability. Uh, there's a slight correction to that, Council. Uh, yes, please. Um, so in the corrigendum uh, which we submitted, um, the 2021 census data for APS employee with disability is 19.1%. Is 19.1%. Thank you. And so a question for each of you, but I will begin with you, Mr. Aiken. The, the number or the, the representation participation rate of people with disability in your agency is higher than the APS-wide average. Why do you think this is? And focusing specifically on today's topic, reasonable adjustments, do you think your policy has anything to do with your numbers? Thank you, Council. Um, look, there are probably two things I would point to. I think the agency, when it was formed, it's, a, it's an agency of eight years now. Uh, it really started with the vision around how does it ensure that it is able to be accessible to all people, and particularly for people with disability in Australia. And work was commissioned in the early days, which actually has formed part of the structural setup of the agency to ensure that we do have policies and practices in place that enables us to be um, accessible to people with disability. Um, I think also too, I would also note that uh, the agency and the uh, employees and labour hire workers who work within it have a very deep passion for the agency. They're drawn to the mission um, of the agency. And we see this also in our census data as well. 
And I think there's a combination of factors that enables us to achieve uh, this level of participation uh, within our agency. Um, in terms of the question specifically around workplace supports, um, yeah, we have a very um, clear policy on ensuring that workplace supports are provided uh, to all people who work within the agency and for those people who specifically request it. Uh, we have a very um, strong focus on ensuring that conversations around adjustments occur at the local level wherever possible. Um, and we also have ensured that wherever possible, we talk about uh, universal design in the way in which we um, set up the agency, uh, which again um, enables these things necessarily, not necessarily to be asked, but um, are, are provided in the way in which we, we set up the agency specifically. Um, Thank you. Uh, turning to you, Mr Chapman, if you could answer the question. Uh, yes, uh, I think it's safe to say we have put a significant focus on, uh, on diversity and inclusion uh, across all forms of diversity, uh, diversity groups over a number of years now, which has seen an increasing trend uh, or an increasing focus, I should say, for us as an organisation. Um, most recently, we have seen a, a, an increase in disability representation within our workforce. Um, that is partly a result of that increased focus, but also because as part of that, we've put a concerted effort into communicating um, the importance of people disclosing uh, diversity status to assist us in planning and providing support so that we can channel information directly to our people that may be of assistance to them. Um, so I think that is certainly certainly assisting people to feel more uh, both aware of the importance and of how to disclose that status if they, if they are comfortable doing so, but also then enables us to uh, ensure that people are aware of the different supports that we can provide for them. I think the... Um, the, the other thing I would flag is we have very much tried to take not a process-driven approach to reasonable adjustment, but looking at individuals and their circumstances quite specifically. So we do have a specialist area that we've set up uh, within, within the corporate HR area. Thank uh, you. We'll come to the detail of what you do in a moment. There, I really just wanted to know if you think your, process, your policy and process around workplace adjustment is one of the reasons for your representation levels. Uh, yes, I do. Okay. And then turning to you, Mr Hudson, are you able to answer that question from your agency's perspective? Yeah, so two, two things briefly. The first thing is we are the department who has responsibility for um, disability in Australia. So um, in a similar way to Mr Aikman, um, some people are drawn to the department based on the nature of the work we do. Um, secondly, um, across the, the board when it comes to diversity and inclusion, uh, we place a lot of emphasis on diversity in the workforce, um, including disability, so I think that also helps. Going to the specific question of the uh, reasonable adjustment policy, um, yes, I think as part of um, a number of different things we do, that is a very important element um, which has collectively um, helped us to achieve those sorts of results. Thank you. And if I could ask you first, Mr Hudson, I'll stick with you. What is it that you, are you able to tell the Royal Commission what it is that the department is seeking to achieve through its adjustments policy? And uh, I'll are you seeking to meet a minimum standard? Are you seeking to facilitate broader participation in the workplace or, or some other thing? Yeah, so essentially what we're looking to achieve is making sure that everybody who would like to work for us or does work for us has the opportunity to perform at their best. So, so slightly different to the two examples you provided, but probably more closely aligned to the second example you provided. It is important um, in Australia that people with disability have an opportunity to participate in the workforce. Um, so that is something that is important to us and something that uh, as a principle underpins our approach to reasonable adjustment. And you have provided to the Royal Commission a copy of your department's policy on reasonable adjustments and you've indicated in your statement that adjustments are made 
as you've said, to minimise the impact of the employee's disability and to enable them to perform the inherent requirements of their job. What I'd like to know from you next is what are the inherent requirements of a job? When are they identified? By whom? And when are they communicated to employees? Yeah, so generally speaking, the inherent requirements of a job are published in what we call a, a position description or a duty statement. So that's generally the material that we advertise uh, when we advertise a job to start with. So what that position description or duty statement says is these are the sorts of tasks and activities that the, the position entails. These are the sorts of skills and capabilities and where relevant qualifications somebody would need to have to fulfil those re job requirements. So do you, is it fair to say that you see um, tasks and activities and skills as um, inherent requirements? They are one and the same? Yes, that's correct. If I could turn to you now, please, Mr Aiken, and ask you the same question. What is it that the NDIA is seeking to achieve through its policy on adjustments? Yep, thank you, Council. Um, so our, our ambition um, is to ensure that we have a, a workforce uh, composition that is truly reflective of the, the society in which we um, operate in. Uh, and, of course, that means um, specifically we want to ensure that we are able to attract and retain people with, dis people with disability. Um, so that, that's, that's, that's central to, to, to our approach. Um, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the impact of that, uh, the workplace adjustment and make, making workplace adjustment is part of ensuring that uh, we're able to, play, to create a great, a great work environment for everyone and that everyone is able to fulfil and, and you know, really bring their best, selves, uh, their best selves to work. And we do measure this as part of our census, uh, our census as well. So I think um, that those are two elements. And probably the third, I would say, is in terms of attraction of, of people and of uh, people to the, to the agency, Again, I think for us, we, we want to make sure that we can cast the net as wide as possible for talented people uh, who can uh, provide, um, provide support to the agency and make a contribution. So I think there's a, a further angle that I would sort of build on what Mr Hudson has talked about. You, in your policy, which commissioners you'll find in bundle C at tab 13H, um, do you have a copy of that policy there, Mr Aiken? Uh, Yep. Workplace adjustment policy. Yeah. Yes. So we see in paragraph three a, a broad framework for the provision of adjustments. As you've just explained, it, it, it's about broader participation in the workplace. Yes. And then that's reflected also in paragraph six. Yes, it is. And then paragraph 11 says, workplace adjustments should assist in removing barriers that may be faced by an employee to meet the inherent requirements of a role. Yes. So my question for you is, do workplace adjustments have that broader focus or are they required to be removing barriers related to inherent requirements? Um, Council, I, I think it's really the, the, it's about removing barriers um, you know, to the wide, to the widest extent, and so to enable full full participation uh, for work in the agency. So, at, at, at paragraph eleven, yes, it does reflect uh, the the statement around removing barriers faced to meet inherent requirements of a role. That's true, but we take a wider we take a wider approach in terms of full participation uh, in the workforce. So perhaps paragraph 11 could be reviewed and modified to reflect what's in paragraphs three and six. Um, yes, Council. Thank you. And just while you have that document in front of you, I'd like to also direct your attention to paragraph 20. And this is where you just, or the agency describes what an inherent requirement is. Yes. And you say, or the policy says, inherent requirements relate to results and what must be accomplished rather than the means or how it is accomplished. That's correct. So is it accurate to say that from your agency's perspective, it's not about skills and tasks and duties, it's about outcomes? 
Um, so if I build on Mr. Hudson's comment, it, it is uh, what he had described. Um, it certainly is about you know the outcomes we seek to achieve. Uh, and the the other element that I would add, uh, you know, in terms of providing uh, full disclosure for any person looking to join the agency is we describe the requirements uh, in, in terms of the elements you just mentioned, but we also provide in our position descriptions the contextual environmental factors as well that really helps um, anyone considering work with the agency, considering all of those factors in terms of making a self-assessment about whether that role is the right role um, for them. So is there something in a position description that would enable a reader to know whether something is an inherent requirement, an essential thing that must be done a particular way, or whether something is part of the job but it is subject to modification? It can be, can be a focus on the achievement rather than the process. Yeah, so the position descriptions really focus more around uh, you know, not the process, but the outcomes is probably the best way I would describe it as it's listed there in Clause 20. And that is clear from a position description. If we don't have one to call up, but if we called up one now, we'd be able to see that from a position description? I would expect you would, yes. But turning to you, Mr Chapman. The, the documents that have been provided to the Royal Commission include um, the ATO's recruitment and onboarding process map and a guide that explains what it means. And Commissioners, for your information, these documents are at um, Bundle C, tabs 7, A, B and C are the ones we're going to be talking about now. Uh, Mr Chapman, do you have those documents in front of you? Uh, yes, I do. Now, to begin with, the recruitment and onboarding process, this is about taking a candidate through a selection process to day one. Uh, that's correct. Is there a separate policy for after day one for the requesting of adjustments in the workplace? Uh, we, we do have content on our intranet, which uh, whilst it's not in the form of a chief executive instruction, it is the, the guidance material so, uh, that we make available to our staff about reasonable adjustment processes. So that takes the place of policy. And that takes the place of policy, did you say? Uh, yes, well, it is effectively the, the approach we take as an organisation to, to reasonable adjustment. And that's not included in the material that's been provided to the Royal Commission? Uh, no, I don't believe it is. Uh, it, does it apply the same processes, the, the same underlying structure as the documents you have provided? Uh, yes, it, yes, it does. So, so effectively, if there is something that, uh, I mean, we certainly, once somebody is in the organisation, if they are... Um, able to liaise with their manager about any changes that or adjustment that they may require, they can do so, but certainly anything that's more complex, just as per the recruitment map, uh, is escalated to one of my health team members who will work with the, with the individual and the manager to ensure appropriate reasonable adjustment can be, can be enacted. If we could just um, look at the... The, the process map that you have provided to us. So this is, as said, Commissioners, the document at um, tab bundle C, tab 7A. And it's questions 19, 18 and 19 to which, to which I direct your attention, Mr Chapman. Um, question 18 requires a candidate to declare if they have a medical condition. They're required to answer yes or no. Uh, yes, that's correct. And this is a mandatory question? Uh, they can choose not to disclose. Um, so, there is, uh, so there is opportunity for people to, uh, to select yes, but they don't. They, they don't have to. And then the next question asks if a person um, needs, requires a reasonable adjustment. That's correct. 
and this question is uh, you can choose not to disclose. That's correct. The second document, uh, so at tab 7B, commissioners, this document, as I understand it, Mr Chapman, is the workplace adjustments question that is required to be completed by candidates. Is that correct? Uh, yes, that is correct. And you'll see right at the bottom of the page, the question about workplace adjustments is described as mandatory. Just my pages are in a different on the screen if that helps you. Uh, okay. Uh, yes. Sorry. It is a it is a, a mandatory question. Sorry. When I said choose not to disclose, I was actually meaning I'm thinking of the unsure button, but different label. Why is it mandatory for a candidate to answer this question? Uh, I think the, uh, the thinking for having that there was so that we would know whether or not we needed to follow up. If somebody had missed it, we'd be unsure whether or not we should follow up with that individual as to whether or not they required, required further, further adjustment. And within the ATO, the provision of adjustments is linked to the performance of inherent requirements of the role. Is that correct? Uh, yes, that, that is correct. And that's the case whether you're seeking an adjustment through the recruitment process map you've provided to us or the in-employment process that you've been telling us about. Uh, I think we, uh, I think that we actually capture the information at two different points because we appreciate that somebody may have a need for reasonable adjustment at the recruitment phase that may not actually uh, be relevant for their subsequent execution of the role or vice versa. Um, so we do provide multiple opportunities for people to raise a need for, for reasonable adjustment. Mm -hmm. I'm talking specifically about um, in the recruitment phase, a candidate might identify a need for adjustments in employment or once they're in employment, the person might identify a need for adjustment. That's correct. And in both those scenarios, the ATO links the provision of that adjustment to inherent requirements. Uh, I, I don't... I, I, I don't know that at interview stage we would limit it solely to that. If somebody needed adjustment just to just to enable them to be interviewed, then we will provide that as well, whether that's specifically linked to their ongoing execution of the role or not. Yes. Um, I'm asking you to leave aside participation in the recruitment process. I'm talking about what the person's going to do if they win the job. Uh, yes, that is linked to the to the inherent requirements of the role. And what are inherent requirements? Who identifies them, and when are they communicated to employees or candidates? Yeah. So much much like Mr. Hudson uh, explained, we we do uh, job design uh, that is done centrally in a workforce strategy, the workforce strategy team. Uh, corporately with the relevant business area where the role is located so that we ensure appropriate standards of documentation are completed. Um, that is then fed into any candidate kit at the point in time that we advertise a role so that, so that individuals who may be interested in that role can see what it is we're expecting. Uh, that does take, or looking for, that does take the form of the skills, knowledge and capabilities and, um, and the outcomes that we're expecting in the role. Uh, uh, that is outlined in the candidate kits that we place on our e-recruitment system that people access when seeking to apply for a role with us. If I could direct your attention to the reasonable adjustment in recruitment and onboarding process map guide. So this was the document at 7A, Commissioners. So on page six of this document, 
we're in a section that's called process observations, which the, the, the heading appears on page five. And then over at page six, you'll see it's come up on the screen now, location. So uh, 10 and 27 refer to steps on your process map. Are you familiar with this document? Uh, I, have, I, I have seen that document. Right. Um, so do you know what steps location 10 and 27 are? I'm just going back to the process map to confirm which steps 10 and 27 were. So 10 provides that the delegate to determine reasonable adjustment considerations for the interview selection process. Delegate in that sense is the person who's making the employment decision. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct. And then 27 is delegate required to decide if the candidate with reasonable adjustments provided is able to perform the inherent requirement of the role. That's correct. And so we see in the column headed observation, the observation is there is a variety of delegates recruitment knowledge and experience. The delegate may not know the inherent requirements of the role. Delegates have been known to change their decision mid-process. This may lead to inconsistent decisions, outcomes for candidates and the organisation. So my question about this is if the delegate doing the recruitment doesn't know what the inherent requirements are or might change their mind mid-process, how can the candidate? Yes, that, this uh, and the particular document you're looking at, I think, is one that was done as a as a review to look at how we can improve the process because we we agree there are flaws there and that would make it challenging for for the individual applicant um, as well as creating challenges for us as an employer. Um, so that is that is one of the reasons why we have uh, a process refined our processes further to have delegates needing to liaise with our health case specialists and also with the workplace manager because in particular where we operate large bulk scale recruitment which we do for some of our nationally distributed business areas the the role type may be uh, have hundreds of positions that we may be seeking to fill uh, reporting to different managers but we have a selection process delegate so we do need to um, bridge the gap, if you like, between the, the delegate for the recruitment process who is familiar with the work but may need further information about the very specific position that the individual is going is being, being looked at for. And so our health case managers will work with both to ensure we can provide advice and, um, and ensure that the right, com the right decisions are being, are being made. But that is a, it is an ongoing challenge. And I, is it the case that that challenge also permeates into the in-employment request? So you're already employed by the ATO, you request an adjustment, that adjustment is going to be assessed against the inherent requirements of the role. This challenge of making sure the decision maker knows what the inherent requirements are, that exists at that point in time also? Uh, it it. It is a challenge. However, what I would flag is we also have the benefit of um, being separate from the recruitment process where you have an individual who is actually in a role, uh, then needing, needing further reasonable adjustment or seeking further reasonable adjustment. Um, they, they are dealing solely with the manager that is the manager of the particular role. Uh, who can liaise with that individual with our, with our health case team. Um, what that does enable us to do is also take into account, um, uh, I guess, the practical day-to-day -day implications of the role. So it is about the inherent requirements of the job, but also uh, any local considerations that may come, in, may come to the fore that would assist or need to be overcome as well. Is there a risk that dealing with it at that local level, you've spoken of the benefits, but is there also a risk that the outcome of your request is then dependent upon your manager's knowledge of obligations or indeed your relationship with the manager and whether they're prepared to accommodate you in a way they may not accommodate someone they don't get on with quite as well? Uh, yes, I, that, I think that is 
that is always a risk in, in any organisation. We, we have a number of strategies in place to try and combat that. Would you like to tell the Royal Commission what they are? Yep, happy to. So we have um, we we are continuing our focus on increasing education and awareness of all of our managers, um, but we also have a range of mechanisms available for any staff to raise concerns if they are unhappy with the response that they're getting. Um, but certainly that includes escalating that to our health case managers who are experts or trained ex have undertaken significant training in order to ensure that they are able to provide advice back to both the individual and to the manager. And if there is if the delegate or the manager disagrees with our recommendation, then we those cases would be escalated um, so that we can ensure that we are meeting meeting the obligations that that and our strategic intent that we've put out. Um, the um, the I think they are they're probably the key the key strategies that we have in place to ensure that people are both building capability but have avenues to raise exceptional cases. And that training that you've referred to, does it specifically address the Disability Discrimination Act? Uh, yes, I believe it does. Thank you. Uh, Mr Hudson, I'm going to turn to you and ask you the, the same theme of question. When a person is in employment... Who makes the decision about the provision of adjustments? So in most cases, the decision is made by the local manager. So the model we operate is um, a centralised uh, policy and expectation setting. So the framework is designed centrally um, uh, and then local decisions are made between individual employees and their manager, uh, the two of whom are in the best position to understand uh, what might be required on the ground. And as I asked Mr Chapman, how do you, how does your department guard against the outcome being dependent upon a, an employee's relationship with their manager? So, so there are several things. So as I mentioned, we have the centralised policy setting and expectation setting requirements. We have a formal uh, what's called review of action uh, or complaints policy, as I referenced in my statement, that people can uh, work through. We also have, though, as part of our broader governance and cultural piece, um, a range of things in place. So, for example, one of my colleagues at the Deputy Secretary level is our disability champion. So they are regularly talking within the organisation from a senior leadership perspective about the topic specifically of disability and disability employment. We have a disability and carer staff network supported by a senior manager uh, who also are looking at issues, escalating concerns, making observations and recommendations about things we could do or do differently. We also have a dedicated diversity and inclusion team within the HR area, uh, which is in my part of the organisation, as well as a dedicated, uh, and sorry, that team includes people um, with disability as well as other diversity backgrounds. And we also have a dedicated uh, disability inclusion officer who can work directly with people with disability um, including to record their details uh, in what's known as a workplace passport. Um, we'll so come to the passport later if we can just... Sure. Uh, so, so, so that gives you a bit of a sense of the sorts of things we do to try and guard against um, the possibility that in a decentralised decision-making model that decisions may, may not always be appropriate or consistent. And finally to you, Mr Aikman, how are decisions taken in your agency and how do you guard against the, the uh, potential that the outcome depends upon your relationship with your manager? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. I think, I think there are many similarities um, to what Mr Hudson um, just spoke to, uh, but certainly from an agency standpoint, uh, we have an expectation um, that, that uh, any requests for adjustment um, are able to be facilitated. Uh, in the same way as Mr Hudson described, we do have a decentralised um, approach in terms of uh, really encouraging both line managers and employees to work together to resolve uh, any requests that are made. Uh, and in the most instance, uh, and for the most part, um, they are. Of course, uh, if in fact there's a, um, a disagreement, uh, there are escalation uh, or complaints handling processes. Um, there are a number of policies that the agency 
uh, has that references um, those procedures um, and who to raise those concerns with. And of course, there's a general obligation of the Public Service Act to you know, review of, you know, a, a, re a review right uh, of any decision that uh, is taken that may impact uh, may impact employment. Um, I think to your point, Council, I think there is um, an ever present uh, risk uh, that uh, you know it would be personal relationships or the like that may uh, impact the decision making uh, process, and hence it's important for us uh, around our education, our training. Um, our clarity around uh, setting obligations and being clear about our obligations to uh, to consider um, any request for a workplace um, workplace adjustment, and there are a number of mechanisms and um, uh, uh, groups within our agency that through which those um, those complaints can be made. Uh, I do have in, within my function uh, a central area a workplace integrity team that reviews reviews these um, review uh, review actions. We have business partners within the agency. We have peer support officers. You know, we have a range of mechanisms where these um, where these issues can be raised. Um, now, as correct me if I'm wrong, but did you say you have a decentralised decision making process, Mr. Aikman? Yeah, so we do. So, in terms of the decentralised process, council, just to clarify, for the most part, that's where decisions are made. Of course, um, if those issues cannot be resolved and are escalated, we do have a centralised workplace supports team and that team will um, undertake uh, a review and assessment of the request that is being, um, that is being made. So, so yes, your policy, if I can just interrupt you, the sure. policy at paragraph 13 says all workplace adjustments are provided, are approved and funded by the workplace support team. Yes, I, I can see that that... That's is that not... Right. The case. No, I think in terms of formal, I think the clarification I would say there, Council, is the, the, the in terms of formalised workplace um, adjustments where there is a, a need, for example, to seek further information, um, undertake a workplace assessment and then determine what potential workplace supports um, are required. Uh, yes, that the workplace supports team uh, manages that. But what I would add is, and you, you may have seen, that this is a, um, uh, a relatively dated policy. This is one that is currently under review uh, and is about to be put before our agency consultative um, committee, our network, uh, and there will be updates to this policy. And I'll, I'll, I'll take a note of that, uh, of that um, clause there, Council. Thank you. Um, so just on the review, since you've brought it up, the, the final page of your policy does have a table where it says review date 26 yes. 11 2017. Is, is that the date it was last reviewed or the date a review was due and you're just getting to it now? Yeah, it was the date that a review was due, um, to be clear on that point. Um, it was the date of review that was expected. Um, it, it has taken time to review it and it has been reviewed. Um, I think in terms of the, the policy um, posture, uh, I guess I would note here that um, there are no fundamental changes to the to the policy, um, but yes, Council, uh, it is currently being reviewed and will be put before our agency consultative network for approval. And there is a, essentially under the, the process you've described, what we might call the practice rather than the policy, there's a two-pronged approach. There are things that can be done at the work level yes. and things that can be escalated. That's correct. And is it the case that irrespective of whether it's at the work level or at the escalated to the workplace support team, that the, the central funding is still correct, that it is funded by one part of your agency? That, that's correct. And as I understand it, the, the move to that central funding was a goal from the 2018 to 2020 Disability Strategy and Action Plan, is that correct? That's correct. Can you tell the Royal Commission why you had that goal? Um, yes, I can. Um, the, the reason being that uh, when it comes to uh, for, you know, formalised supports where uh, there may be a need uh, for funding to support it, we wanted to ensure that there was objectivity in terms of making sure that those provisions were provided. So. This is one of the elements that you spoke to Council earlier about guarding against you know, local decisions where um, the provision of uh, you know, funded supports uh, is needed, um, that that in some way is not discounted 
And so we increase the objectivity of that process by centralising uh, the, uh, the assessment and the provision of supports. So is it the case that that central funding separates the cost of the adjustment, if there is a cost, from the performance of the employee? So nobody takes the view that this adjustment is a, an employment cost of any particular person? No, that, that's correct. It, remove, it removes that, um, that distinction. Thank you. Mr Hudson, in your statement, you say at paragraph 47 that there's centralised funding, but then at paragraph 52, you indicate the work area pays. So can I ask you to tell the Royal Commission which it is? Uh, it, it's both council. So um, for many of the workplace adjustments, they are dealt with and funded locally, but there may be circumstances where um, a work area is of the view that they don't have sufficient funding for a particular uh, adjustment and then they can seek support from the central HR area. So it is, it is actually both. So what kinds of things would not be paid for at the local area? Um, so um, I can't think of any specific examples of what wouldn't be paid for at the local level. Um, uh, uh, and in fact, we haven't uh, had to use that central funding um, very often. Um, I don't have the figures with me, but the, the amount of money spent from that particular allocation is fairly small because most things are actually dealt with centrally. But um, there, there, there could be an example um, of, of which I can't sort of name uh, where, where there is a need for some additional assistance and that, that can then be discussed between the work area and the HR team. Now, you've indicated in your statement that uh, the department doesn't capture the number of adjustments requested and provided. It, it, firstly, is there a reason why you don't capture that? Uh, well, firstly, because we operate in a decentralised model, um, there's no kind of central recording system, and, and, and many adjustments um, uh, by their very nature uh, wouldn't necessitate uh, capturing necessarily. So, for example, um, if a person needed a document holder to, 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 as part of their reasonable adjustment, um, the, the, there doesn't appear to be any apparent benefit of, of capturing that, you know, a, a, an individual person required a document holder. But something like a document holder, um, that would be ordered by the local branch uh, in, in the monthly kind of equipment and stationary ordering. So um, what, what we, our rationale is, you know, thinking about the utility of capturing those sorts of things. Having said that, um, it is obvious having uh, answered these questions that we actually don't have this ability across the board. Um, I have been able to collect some manual data uh, since the statement uh, on some things which you might uh, like to hear about. Um, but one of the things I have identified is that because we don't collect data centrally, um, I don't necessarily have the line of sight uh, that would tell me whether or not the policy is working effectively. So in the context of reviewing our current diversity inclusion strategy and the new version will be launched early next year, it's one of the things I've asked the team to have a think about and look at is how do we operate a central policy framework with central expectation setting and a decentralised decision-making framework, but how do we then have some line of sight and visibility about whether or not that's actually effective? So I think that's a gap at the moment. One of the things this Royal Commission has heard about is a perception that it's expensive to employ people with disability, that they require costly adjustments. If you don't capture the cost of adjustments that are provided, how are you ever going to combat that perception? Um, well, to, to be fair, you, you can't without an evidence base. So, so without an evidence base, you can't combat um, perceptions. Um, uh, two things I would say is, uh, one, as I mentioned, we are looking at what kind of data we could and should be capturing uh, to, to help us. Um, secondly, um, while I appreciate that's the perception um, that, that you have been hearing, I don't have a sense within our organisation that financial restraints are, uh, are a consideration when, we, when we're applying reasonable adjustments. Of course, I'll qualify that by saying I don't have the data to back that up. Thank you. Uh, turning to you, Mr Chapman, as I understand it, within the ATO, the costs of adjustments 
are covered by what's called ATOP or ATO people, um, ATO IT and job access or the Employment Assistance Fund. Is that correct? Uh, that that is correct for for any any assistance that is generated out of a health case uh, or a, a formal request that is escalated to my area. But uh, much like much like uh, my colleague at DSS, um, we also will have any number of, of adjustments that are made at the work, local workplace level, particularly where they are not uh, requiring corporate support for integration into software systems or. Uh, building modifications or more significant things. So, again, if you look at things like footstools, um, document holders, uh, shifts in time, uh, working hours to accommodate treatments and things like that, they would not be costed and captured into our into our corporate systems, uh, unlike the things that are generated with, because they are more significant or they're more complex or they are a result of a health case that um, that identifies a need for, for, for reasonable adjustment. Would it be fair to say that you capture the expensive things but you don't capture the low or no cost things? Uh, yes, I think that's a, a fair, fair assessment. Might that skew a perception to say that adjustments are expensive? Uh, uh, look, I... It, it could. There is a risk of that. I, I would say our business areas don't see the cost of those costs. Um, we don't talk about cost widely, uh, and and I think that helps to mitigate that. So, given a lot of the any of those more significant costs are borne corporately and not by the individual business areas, our business areas and local managers don't really have cause to see. That uh, that disability adjustments are an expensive impact on their their local budget. So, if we look in your statement at paragraph eighty, you've provided. Oh, sorry, it's um, Mr. Page's statement at paragraph eighty, a table setting out the cost of support and equipment, interpreter services, and DHS accessibility support. These are those big cost items we were talking about. Uh, yes, these are yes, they are the items that we have uh, picked up corporately, um, which generally tend to be those larger larger items or ongoing items. And you're saying that the, the local work area never sees this cost; they wouldn't know about this. Uh, I, I believe, whilst there may be some instances where a manager would see see some of that, if if we were Required their input to um, to a specific case we were putting forward to the employment assistance fund or something like that. They they may see it, but they don't actually bear the cost of it in their local area, so they don't feel any impact of that, even if they do see it. I want to turn now to the um, question of adjustments that are requested but not provided. And Mr. Hudson, if I could start with you. You say at paragraph 54 that you don't have this information. And so my question to you is why not? Um, so it goes to my previous answer, Council. Um, we, we, we don't collect this information centrally and um, that is a gap from my perspective. Um, uh, from my perspective, understanding whether or not the workplace adjustment policy is achieving the outcome that's designed to achieve is difficult to make that judgment without data. And so this is an area we are looking to um, understand better through our next diversity inclusion strategy early next year, um, but it is a gap. Thank you. Um, Mr Chapman, it, this is addressed in uh, paragraph 83 of Mr Page's statement, and he refers to adjustments um, not being provided if the ATO is unable to accommodate the request and then lists things such as security constraints, compatibility issues with the ATO systems, and that um, other employees might be impacted negatively or it might contravene an OHS policy. Um, you've adopted his statement, so do I take it from that you agree these are the reasons the ATO might say no to a request? Uh, yes, that is correct. And do you accept that the statutory test is not whether or not the ATO is able to accommodate a request? 
uh, yes, uh, I think there are there are some, uh, as I understand it, some limits in terms of unjustified hardship, but um, but in general, yes. And so that phrase, unjustifiable hardship, is is that something that you you're familiar with? Uh, I, I have a level of familiarity with it, yes. And is it something that's addressed in the training that's given to the people who make decisions about whether to provide adjustments? Uh, yes, I believe that is the case. We certainly have written materials that we make available to people who are involved in those decisions that do go to explaining the, that, con that very concept. And would you be confident to say that notwithstanding what is in 80, paragraph 83, that the ATO only declines to provide requested accommodations where it would impose an unjustifiable hardship to do so? Uh, yes, I think that uh, calling out those, those examples as outlined in paragraph 83 as, as examples of that, yes. And uh, turning to you then, Mr Aikman, at paragraph 69 of your statement. Yes. Sorry, I'm just having trouble with the folder. So you indicate that the NDIA, the most common reasons why a, an adjustment has not been provided and... Uh, you've given us A, B and C. A is it's not considered reasonably practicable after consideration of the relevant legislation and standards. You see that in your statement? Yes, I do. Do you accept that reasonably practicable is not the test in the relevant legislation? Yes. So if the NDIA is making decisions on requests for adjustments by reference to the incorrect test, does that suggest to you you need to review your policy and the training that supports it? Um, Council, thank you. Um, we will do that. Um, if, if I could say uh, further, uh, in terms of the consideration for reasonable adjustments, um, the agency has a posture of always looking to find the reasonable adjustment. And uh, there are very limited instances, I believe, where we are unable to provide a reasonable adjustment. So for the vast majority of the requests, we're able to facilitate, uh, facilitate it. Thank you. I want to move now very quickly to the final topic of workplace passports. And these, um, each of your agencies have identified this as something that you, you use or you make available on a voluntary basis, to be accurate. In his evidence on Monday, Mr Innes spoke about these employment passports as a way for an adjustment to be effectively carried with a person throughout their employment. So if they're transferred or promoted, their approved adjustment can just go with them. Firstly, and very briefly, do you each agree that that is what its purpose is in your agency? I'll begin with you, Mr Hudson. Yes, I do. Mr Aikman? Yes, I do. Mr Chapman? Yes, I do. Now, Mr Aikman, you have provided the Royal Commission with the copy of your agency's Employee with a Disability Annual Survey. Yes. Commissioners, you have that at tab C, uh, 13D. Mr Aikman, in that survey, less than half of the respondents to the survey who indicated that they used the passport rated it as effective in supporting the continuity of their arrangements. Yes. What steps has the NDIA taken to understand what sits behind that result and how they can improve the effectiveness of passports. Yes, um, so uh, thank you, Council. So as a consequence of uh, that uh, survey, um, work has commenced in terms of um, the development of our commitment 
uh, our commitment. And part of that commitment is to review uh, specifically the passport. We recognise that there is a low take up uh, because, and, and part of it has been its voluntary status. And I think secondly, the decentralised way in which it is being managed. Uh, we certainly uh, ascribe to the objective of wanting to ensure that uh, employees do not have to either, you know, relive, re-justify the reasons for which um, a workplace adjustment has been provided. And that should carry through uh, in all aspects of either in the current role or any other role that a person may do in their employment uh, with the agency. We have as part of our action plan, as part of our disability commitment to work with our um, representative group, which we call the Employee Disability Network. And we'll be working specifically with that group of people to ensure that people with disability um, provide input in terms of the co-design and consultation. Um, and then as a consequence of that, and I do not know the outcome at this point, but we will revisit and obviously um, implement changes to improve, uh, in, to improve its uptake and its um, effectiveness. Thank you. Turning to you, Mr Hudson, the template passport that appears in your, or your department's policy has at the very end an email address inviting the, the user of the passport to email to so that the use of the passport can be tracked. Are you able to tell us how many workplace adjustment passports are used in your agency? So uh, noting they are voluntary, uh, we have 164 staff who can't identify as having a disability. There is no requirement for an employee to um, share that centrally. However, I can advise the Commission that 12 individuals have shared their passport with the Central Diversity and Inclusion Team. So when you say shared their passport, that's allowed you to have access to it or just told you that they're using it? No, no, actually allowed access to it. So provide us with a copy of their completed passport. It's a very low take-up rate. Well, as I indicated, it is a voluntary thing, so we shouldn't assume that every individual employee will have a passport to begin with. And then secondly, sharing it with the central team is also voluntary. Notwithstanding that, 12 is a very small number. One of the things that uh, I've asked the team to look into, uh, along with those other couple of things I mentioned earlier, uh, is uh, whether we can actually get a sense of um, the actual take-up and effectiveness of this particular um, activity that we have in place. And finally to you, Mr Chapman, are you able to uh, tell the Royal Commission anything about um, the use of workplace passports in the ATO and how effective they are at achieving that goal of continuity of adjustments? Yes, we, uh, so we do, we do have passports. We currently have approximately 75 in, in place, uh, 75 employees with current passports. Um, it isn't just to assist the employee if they move throughout the organisation, but obviously being in a large organisation where you have changes in managers come through, um, then it also assists with, um, with smoothing that process. So it might not be the individual that moves, but the person they report to that moves. Um, we, we uh, as my colleagues, have identified that there is definitely potential for us to do a, to make further improvements and so that is one of our one of our current actions that that is kicking off to look at what it is we will need to do engaging our our employee and ally network um, as as well as other stakeholders to uh, to inform where we might take that moving forward as well. Thank you. Uh, just one final point. Uh, when I was asking you about statistics, Mr Chapman, I got the numbers around the wrong way and my team of instructing solicitors have pointed out to me in the ATO census for 2021, the correct number is 1,126. Mr Chapman, do you agree with that? Uh, that that is that certainly sound sounds about about right. I can't tell you the census number off the top of my head, but that is that is about the about the number. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you. I had said one thousand one hundred and sixty-two. You agreed with me. I just want to make make it sure we've got it round the right way. Uh, thank you. No further questions, Commissioner. Thank you very much, Commissioner Ryan. Do you have any questions? Um, just a couple. Um, we've focused largely on adjustments. But I do um, find useful that uh, in your submission uh, from the ATO, 
you've provided some detail about um, recruitability. And uh, among the data that you've provided, it indicates about 8,000 people have, or nearly 9,000 people have used recruitability. Uh, only 369, which is about 400, 4% of the people who've used it have gone on to be appointed. Does it suggest that 96% of people don't get an appointment using that process? Does that suggest that it might need to be evaluated as to whether it's either A, working, or B, a valuable, um, a valuable tool in increasing disability employment? Uh, I think it's very challenging to draw that conclusion from those numbers purely because that is the number of people who have um, applied for a role selecting that box. And if I look at um, if I look at uh, last financial year, we had in excess of eighty thousand applicants for for roles. But certainly, it's a very small portion of that eighty thousand who we were we were in a position to hire. So this. These are numbers of applicants, not necessarily a uh, total number of people who we gave roles to, if I can draw that distinction. That's true, but you said you report that 13% of the people were employed, were, were allocated to a talent pool. Uh, my yes. understanding is that means that they met the requirements to be, uh, to be appointed, but someone else must have been better than them. Um, so they're in a talent pool. Have we any idea how successful any of them might be? My general experience is talent pools are not greatly accessed within the public service. People like to do a fresh recruitment. So it just means that a lot of people are going through a process in which they're not quite successful. We might need to do something else to enhance their success, mightn't we? Uh, look, potentially. I think we certainly maintain active merit, merit lists, as you're, as you're suggesting, uh, to assist us with filling subsequent vacancies throughout throughout the year. So we certainly don't appoint everybody who makes it through to, to one of our merit lists or, or talent pools, as you've, as you've referenced them as. Um, so, so there will be people who have identified with recruitability who do not gain a position, as there will be people who have not identified or ticked the box to, to say that they are seeking recruitability. Um, who will also not get a position. Um, we are actually kicking off a review early in the new year with the um, National Disability, um, uh, the Australian National Disability uh, Network on Disability, sorry, uh, to become a disability confident recruiter, which will further help us to address any potential issues that exist of the nature that you're referring to. Uh, so we, we see this as an ongoing focus of work. Uh, certainly not something that we've addressed all the challenges that, that already exist. We, we, we know we have more work to do and we're continuing on that path. Using the data that you provide on page two of the submission from the ATO, it would indicate you need roughly um, 1,200 more people with disability to be employed in the ATO to meet the, uh, the Australian Public Service target of 7% of people with a disability working for the ATO. That would suggest, unless you're going to rely entirely on getting people to move from um, a survey reporting anonymously their disability to reporting it specifically, that would suggest a very vigorous uh, program of recruitment of people with disabilities required, but there's nothing in your submission which would indicate that you've addressed yourself to how you might review and revamp the way in which you do particularly external recruitment in order to make that happen. Um, is there any reason why that is not a consideration? Uh, no, I, I believe that actually speaks to the very, the very point I was just making uh, about our work uh, to become disability confident recruiters. And we've certainly had a, a range of training that we've been conducting across all of our recruitment team members and delegates over the over the last year in particular we've increased our focus there uh, as well as you'll note in the submission the trialing of affirmative measures recruitment processes as well um, over the last six months that we've been that we've been doing to further increase numbers um, I guess the other thing I would flag is I, I think you may be looking at Mr Page's statement I, I also provided an updated statement um, we've seen an increase of 50% in the percentage of our staff 
who identify with disability since Mr Page's statement uh, on, on account of us actually communicating the awareness um, of the importance of people identifying where they feel comfortable doing so and the potential benefits. Um, and we've also been reviewing the processes through which people can actually uh, capture and record that information to, to make it easier for them to do so. So we're continuing to see that number increase, but, but we will also be um, undertake continuing our efforts to improve recruitment, including uh, a review of our number neurodiversity recruitment program recently, uh, which we uh, will be conducting a, a new round of next year as well. So we have a, a range of programs in place that we expect to see further lift that dis disability representation rate. Right? Thank you. Thank you, Mr Chair. Thank you. Commissioner Galbally, do you have any questions? Um, just to follow on from Commissioner Ryan, um, I'd be, and also to relate back to Mr. Graham Innes's evidence earlier in the week, um, Mr. Chapman, is it in your um, KPIs or the, um, the Secretary's KPIs about getting the recruitment of people with disabilities up to 7% and retention and reasonable adjustment? Are there KPIs that you have to meet on this topic? Uh, we certainly have KPIs in place for representation. Um, now, we, we don't specifically tie that to recruitment uh, because we actually see that we, we, well, we know through the employee census that we have more people in the organisation who, uh, who have identified as having disability through that, that process than they have in our HR systems. Um, so we actually think there's more work we also need to be doing to ensure inclusion within the workplace that will lift that. Uh, that is something that we have in the ATO's corporate plan, which we've published externally with, with commitments and targets. Uh, it is something we report on in the Commissioner of Taxation's annual report, which is tabled in Parliament, and it is certainly something that is in my business plan. And more importantly, we are actually, as part of our new diversity and inclusion strategy, we have said this should not be purely HR driven. To be a truly inclusive organisation, we require all leaders to be held accountable. And so through our people committee, what we will be doing is actually developing contextualised targets for each of our business areas that their senior leaders will be held accountable to as well. So I will be accountable for the organisational approach but we will be ensuring that all areas across the organisation uh, and leaders within them are held accountable as well. And Mr Hudson, a similar question to you as to where it's measured. Is it measured at secretary level? Is it in their, their KPIs or is it in yours or where is it? So, so Commissioner, certainly um, the Secretary of the Accountable Authority is accountable for all performance measures in the organisation. Um, this is uh, a particular target and therefore a KPI that we have. As the Chief Operating Officer, I'm also uh, accountable. Um, but uh, a bit like with Mr Chapman, um, it's, not, it's not something that we uh, uh, appoint to a single individual because actually what we're looking for is a broad approach across the organisation where everybody contributes to achieving the outcome. But yes, ultimately the Secretary as the Accountable Authority um, has that accountability. Thank you. Um, Mr. Aikman, do you want to answer that in terms of the NDIA? Yes, thank you, Commissioner. Um, I'll probably build on uh, largely some of the comments that have already been made. I mean, I think at the at the headline level, uh, is there an explicit um, you know target that's attached to you know the uh, you know, the performance of um, of any senior executive? Um, it forms part of uh, it perform, forms part of a if you like a. Um, a number of um, KPIs that the organisation um, seeks to achieve. Uh, we regularly report on this um, internally so that um, you know, accountable executives are aware of the performance um, across each of the groups and the divisions within the agency. And of course, we also publish uh, the corporate plan and our reporting against that corporate plan externally um, each year. Thank you. Mr Chapman, I just wanted to return to the, the item that was put up on the screen, number 18 for a recruitment, where I thought it said required to declare if they have a medical condition or a disability, that it wasn't optional. It reads required 
and it read required on the screen, I think. Uh, that was, I think that was the um, reasonable, is that the reasonable adjustment question and it's a mandatory field? Do you, uh, no, that's the do you require an adjustment and that's mandatory, yeah. but there was one before that. So document. Um, I rather thought the question was asked about that. It yes, it was asked, but it was answered yeah, that, it was, that it well, was. Maybe um, Mr Chapman can let us know about that and uh, give us some. Well, the reason I'm asking is because I think it's a very important point as to whether people are required to declare their disability or their medical condition. So I'd really like to know about that. Mr Chapman can give us an answer to that in writing. Thank you. And my final question I'm is... I'm sorry, I think we're running over time, Commissioner Galbally, and uh, I think we might just end it there if you don't mind. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. I understand that nobody will wish to ask any questions of the group. Um, so thank you very much for your attendance, for the evidence you have given and the statements that you have provided. Uh, we appreciate your assistance. It's now 1.05. I take it you wish to adjourn for 45 minutes? I wish to do the tendering before we adjourn, if I may, Chair. Yes, all right. Yes. Tender the statement of Liam Page, dated 18 June 2021, proposed to be Exhibit 19-20, yeah. with annexures 19-20.1 through to 19-20.5. The statement of Bradley Chapman, dated the 27th of October 2021, as 19-21. The statement of Hamish Aikman, dated 23 June 2021, 19-22, with annexures 19-22.1 through to 19-22.10. And the statement of Adrian Hudson, dated the 18th of June 2021, as 19-23, with annexures 19-23.1 through to 19-23.9. Yes, those documents uh, may be admitted into evidence, they will be given the exhibit numbers uh, indicated uh, on this bell set. Thank you very much. Um, we'll, it's now just after five past one, we'll resume at uh, 1.50. The Royal Commission is adjourned. The Royal Commission is now in session. Yes, uh, thank you. I understand that uh, there is uh, an appearance to be announced for WorkSafe Victoria. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, if the Commission pleases, I appear for Victorian Work Cover Authority, WorkSafe Victoria. Thank you, Ms. Harris. Yes, Ms. Harris. Thank you, uh, Commissioners. Commissioners, all Australian states and territories have laws that impose duties on persons conducting what are described as business and undertakings, and that includes employers. The duty is to ensure the health and safety of those in the workplace and to eliminate risks as far as reasonably practicable. So a person who conducts a business or undertaking must ensure, so far as reasonably practical, that the workplace itself is safe for workers. Workers include not only employees, but also contractors, uh, volunteers, and students gaining work experience. It means employers must have a keen eye to ensure the maintenance of the working environment to check on the safety in the workplace, to ensure safe use and handling of the way in which, for example, substances in the workplace are used. But work health and safety is not just limited to physical risks. It's now well accepted that the health of workers and the conditions in the workplace should be monitored in a way that prevents illness or injury. And in more recent years, there's been a recognition that this includes addressing issues such as bullying and harassment in the workplace. But the duties don't necessarily and exclusively rely on the employer, that workers themselves have duties to take reasonable care for their own health and safety. 
The reasonable care is to ensure that their acts and omissions in the workplace do not adversely affect the health and safety of others. And there's also an obligation to comply with reasonable instructions in relation to maintaining work health and safety. So commissioners at public hearing nine, you heard evidence from Susan Colbert from the Australian Network on Disability, an organisation that's been referred to by a number of witnesses at this hearing about the result of Comcare's 2018 employer mobilisation project. The project involved a survey of about 2,400 people involved in hiring and management of staff and or the development of staff policies and initiatives. It also was accompanied by a series of in-depth interviews to get a bit of an insight in terms of the experiences and perceptions within organisations, specifically to the extent to which organisations were open, confident and had the capacity to support people with disability in the workplace. This work, this research revealed that employers tended to focus on the risk when hiring people with disability and a presumption that people with disability include the uh, associated risks of heightened injury and the risk of liability for employers. So the identification of these risks raised two important issues. In the area of regulating workplaces and employment, there is an obligation to ensure that all workers uh, maintain health, safety and welfare. And secondly, we know that in this area, there is also an obligation that employers have relevant insurance in the form of workers' compensation schemes. The question for this panel is, if these two areas, work health and safety, and the regulation of workers' compensation schemes, which are intended to support and provide safe working conditions, are a reason for excluding people with disability, then the Royal Commission needs to understand why and what needs to be done to address perhaps the myths and the misapprehension that people with disability are themselves a risk. So this panel, we have uh, a panel, fairly large panel. We have representatives from Safe Work Australia. Safe Work Australia is charged with developing national policy in relation to work health and safety and workers' compensation. And we're also joined by two regulators, Comcare and WorkSafe Victoria. So I might start just by introducing the panelists and then we'll address a number of particular topics. So can I start with Safe Work Australia? Uh, uh, I think Ms. Michelle Baxter is part of a panel, but you're very distant, so I'm not sure which, which one of the three people sitting in front of a green wall is Ms. Baxter. Uh, good afternoon. I'm the person sitting in the middle. Uh, to my left is my Deputy CEO, Amanda Johnston, and to my right is Leah Edwards. Thank you. So, Ms Baxter, you've prepared a statement for the Royal Commission and commissioners, you'll find that in bundle A at tab 52. And Ms Baxter, you are the Chief Executive Officer of Safe Work Australia. Yes, that is correct. Uh, and and you, I'm also a non... Oh, I beg your pardon. And you prepared a statement uh, dated the 3rd of September this year? Yes, I did. And uh, have you had an opportunity to read the statement? Yes, I have. Are there any corrections that you wish to make to the statement? Uh, none, thank you. Uh, are the contents of that statement true and correct? Yes, they are. And I understand it that you're giving evidence in relation to the content of your statement. Is that right? That's correct. Now, you have Ms Johnson with you, the Deputy Chief Executive Officer, and Ms Edwards, the General Counsel. Um, now, can I ask uh, both of you, you've not prepared any statement for the Royal Commission? No, we have not. No, we have not. Can you tell me what your evidence is intended to address today? 
Oh, well, if I can start, Leah Edwards here, General Counsel. Um, I understood that a part of the panel was to explore the issues uh, raised in Ms Baxter's um, witness statement and to explore the operation of the Model Work Health and Safety Scheme, its interaction with um, disability discrimination legislation, equal opportunity legislation, and in that regard, um, both... Um, Ms Johnston and myself um, considered that we had um, appropriate knowledge and understanding of the relevant, um, the wider employment regime, the operation of the model laws and the um, various points of intersection with uh, disability discrimination uh, legislation. Well, um, is it the case that for the two of you that you're proposing to answer questions on, on what basis that Ms Baxter is unable to do so? Uh, Ms Eastman, um, the purpose of the three of us being here this afternoon is to provide as much assistance as we possibly can to, the, to yourself and to the Commission. Um, there are matters that I have um, some detail of of which uh, Ms Johnston and Ms Edwards have far greater detail and we thought that would be of, of great assistance today. All right, well, thank you for that clarification. So commissioners, uh, there are three representatives from Safe Work Australia and you have a statement from one only. Mr Radford, can I turn to you? Yes. Uh, commissioners, this is Colin Radford. He is the CEO of the Victorian Work Cover Authority which uh, operates by the name of WorkSafe Victoria. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. And you've prepared a statement for the Royal Commission dated 22 October. Yes, I have. And commissioners, you'll see a copy of that behind tab 60 in volume A. Mr Radford, have you had an opportunity to read your statement? Yes, I have. Are there any corrections that you wish to make? No, there are not. And uh, are the contents of the statement true and correct? Yes, they are. Thank you. I'll come back to you in a moment. Yes. Then we have uh, two representatives from Comcare. Ms Weston, can I start with you? You are the CEO of Comcare? Yes. And you've prepared a statement dated 3 September? Yes. Have you read that statement? I have. Are there any changes that you wish to make to the statement? A small change. Um, Can you please. tell me what that is? As noted in Ms Beaker's statement, uh, she has moved to a position in the Federal Department of Health. Therefore, I need to amend my statement at paragraph 50I to reflect that Ms Beaker is no longer Comcare's SES Diversity Champion or Chair of our Diversity Inclusion Group. These roles have now been taken up by another member of Comcare's Senior Executive Service. I'm not aware of any other corrections that need to be made. Thank you, Ms Weston. So with those corrections, or perhaps by way of clarification, are the contents of your statement true and correct? Yes. Um, Ms Beekus, you are Natalie Beekus. Correct. And we've just heard that you were the General Manager Strategic Partnerships and Engagement Group of Comcare, but you've now moved to the Department of Health? Correct. And I think you foreshadowed that around the time that you're preparing the statement. So you've made uh, a statement, Commissioners, it appears at tab 10 in Part A, with some amendments to that statement, which the Commissioners have in writing at tab 17. Uh, are there any other corrections that you wish to make to your statement? No, they're not. And are the contents of that statement true and correct? Yes. Now, Ms Speakers, while I've got you, I might start with the uh, Employer Mobilisation Project. You refer to that in your statement at paragraph 39 in the context of something called <clears throat> a collaborative partnership. So... Uh, the Royal Commission has heard last year and also through your evidence about the Employer Mobilisation Project and the, res the re results of that research indicating that there were some fears or perhaps some reservations about employers taking on employees with a range of disabilities. Is that right? That's correct. 
Right. Now, I might just uh, put up onto the screen the document that you've provided to the Royal Commission, which is not the whole of the report, which is very detailed and has lots of tables, but you've very helpfully provided a document that uh, is described as an infographic or summary. So if we turn to the second page of that document, which has the percentage numbers on that, is this something that you're familiar with? Yes, it is. And looking at, at the results of this research indicated that 50% of the people who participated in the survey were not confident in their business's ability to support people with physical or psychological disability or a health condition. 53% believe the workplace culture is not supportive of people with disability with a physical or psychological disability or health condition. And 36% believe their workplace has low capacity to accommodate people with a physical or psychological disability or health condition. So that was sort of the broad overarching finding. And then this document, if we scroll down a bit, sets out the keys to barriers to recruiting, supporting and adjusting. Now, one of the findings was that most businesses feel that the loss of sight would be the most difficult disability to accommodate. And you'll see on this page that there uh, are a range of different types of disability, if I could describe them broadly that way. And the response of employers to, could I put it this way, the employer's confidence in engaging people with a particular disability. Now, please correct me if I've done any disservice in trying to summarise the, the results in a very shorthand way. Uh, no, that is correct. Right. Now, the purpose of this research was to be part of a broader collaboration process, which you've set out in your statement, and uh, it may assist the commissioners to understand the context of this research. So if you have your statement with you, uh, and if you need to refer to it, let me know. But are we right in understanding that there are, there's a piece of work that involved five pillars, and one of the pillars related to this research, but the balance of the pillars is really looking at a very sort of holistic approach to identifying what might be attitudinal barriers, but also practical measures to ensure that there will be increased workforce participation for people with disability. Uh, yes, that is correct. The only thing that I would add is that it does take a systems of systems approach. So one of the things is looking at the system as a whole. Um, you've heard from a number of people that from individual systems, the Collaborative Partnership to Improve Work Participation aims to look at the systems as a whole cross-sectorally across Australia's income and benefit systems. Now, looking at the way in which the partnership operates, you tell the Royal Commission at paragraph 41 that there are a number of partners in both the public and private sectors so this includes at a public sector level, the Department of Education, Skills and Employment, the Department of Social Services, the National Disability Insurance Agency and the Department of Health. They're all Commonwealth agencies, I take it. Right. And the non-public um, sector partners included the Insurance Council of Australia, Employers Mutual Limited, the Australasian Faculty of Occupational and Environmental Medicine and the Australian Council of Trade Unions, together with two expert advisors. Is that right? That's correct. Now, are we right in understanding that Safe Work Australia is not part of the collaborative partnership? That's correct. And looking at the list of people involved, there's no organisation that would be I could loosely describe a disability representative organisation. That is correct. Is there any reason why there is no representation from people with disability in the collaborative partnership? 
there's probably so at an individual so you've spoken to the five pillars at an individual project or pillar level there is engagement um, with disability advocates and a variety of employers and other stakeholders at that level working on the individual work or forming part of um, the steering committee for that work but at the collaborative partnership level we were seeking um, in-kind contribution or financial contribution uh, towards this work uh, and at this stage no one has it is open to anyone to um, come forward to be a member. We have worked with Anne and Suzanne Colvert, who you've already mentioned, is familiar with this work and has been part of, one example of being part of the work that we have been doing at the individual project level. Uh, Ms. Beckers, could I ask you just to slow down a little with your responses because we have to uh, keep a real time transcript and translate uh, into uh, Auslan. So if you just go a little bit slower, that would help us. So just summarising mm. the, the pillars, and you've set this out in some detail in the statement. So pillar one and pillar two are focused on schemes and systems, as you've described. That's measuring the movement of people between systems and supporting people moving between systems. Pillar three and four is focused on employers and workplaces. And that's improving employer capability. And pillar four is driving cultural and behavioural change. And pillar five focuses on providers, providing general practitioners support to facilitate work participation. So can I ask you uh, how the research done for pillar three, which is the, the uh, employer mobilisation project that we've just looked at, how has that assisted in developing the work for Pillar 4? And can you tell the Royal Commission at what stage is the Pillar 4 work, which is driving cultural and behavioural change, how is that progressing? Sure. Um, so the work of Pillar 3 has been published and is publicly available, and we've also been promoting the findings and the insights across employers and across uh, the stakeholder groups that do follow the collaborative partnership to improve work participation. So partly it's about raising awareness. That work is being considered in the future strategy now around this work that we've been working um, with Department of Education, Skills and Employment on. Uh, and I also refer to my statement around future work that we've been doing with Swinburne University, looking at employment services more broadly. In terms of Pillar 4, um, as I mentioned earlier, this work is being co-funded by the members that you have listed, Ms Eastman, and uh, at this present time, we're not in a position financially to be able to raise an above-the-line campaign. What we have done, though, is engage with our partners, Department of Social Services, who have the lead around the disability, National Disability Employment Strategy, and we have offered to provide our insights, uh, research and findings to support their work, which is obviously um, subject to further budgetary reviews and processes that still need to occur. But certainly we are very much and very keen to support where we can those, those other organisations that have the funding and support to carry this forward. Ms Baxter, uh, you've set out in your statement the function of Safe Work Australia as the national policy body in Australia, and this includes the functions of developing and evaluating national policies and strategies, developing and evaluating a model work health safety legislation framework, undertaking research, collecting, analysing, reporting data, developing national education and community communication strategies and a range of other matters that involve both advice to Commonwealth, state and territory uh, regulators. Uh, this work that Comcare has undertaken as part of the collaborative partnership would be very important work for your agency to be involved in, would it not? Uh, we are aware of the work that's being undertaken and are closely watching it as it develops. But do you I accept understand. it would be relevant to the, the functions that you're required by the statute to discharge? So my understanding is that the, the work uh, that Comcare is doing goes towards primarily pre-engagement of a worker um, work health and safety laws 
operate post the engagement period. They come into play. That's when the, the jurisdiction for work health and safety is enlivened. So, so are you telling me it's relevant or not relevant? It, it's, it's work that we're observing and tracking, but it's, it's not squarely within, in our view, the work health and safety uh, remit. Right. So in terms of, of tracking, uh, what have you done with respect to tracking this work done by ComCare as part of the collaborative partnership? Uh, so we work closely with ComCare. I have a very strong relationship with the CEO of ComCare. We regularly discuss work that we each have on hand. Uh, Sorry to jump in now. I'm just asking about the employer mobilisation project, not generally the relationship between the agencies. I'm not sure that I've got anything that I can say of any substance on that. I can have a look and come back to the Commission in terms of any work that we are specifically doing in relation to that project. Mr Radford, uh, this project is not Victorian specific, but are you aware of the work undertaken by ComCare as part of the collaboration partnership? No, I was not aware in any, in any detail until uh, Ms Becker explained it. Part of the function of Safe, Work Safe Victoria is also to do research, is that right? Yes, we do. And uh, has your agency undertaken research of this kind to look at the question, for example, of what might be perhaps the reluctance or reservation about employers employing people with disability? Uh, I might take that on notice, if I may. I'm not aware that we have done research specific to that question, um, but I will, uh, if I can take that on notice, I will advise uh, the Commission accordingly once I've been able to establish uh, whether we have done so. Thank you. Ms Weston, you've said in your statement that ComCare has no evidence or data to indicate whether a person with a disability creates a greater health and safety risk in the workplace. That's what you say, paragraph 43. Yes. Um, to the extent you say that there's no evidence or data, other than the work done as part of the employer mobilisation project, are we right in understanding that ComCare doesn't collect data that seeks to measure the extent to which a person with disability either creates a work health and safety risk in the workplace? There's nothing to, that even measures that. So um, the employment of a person with a disability wouldn't create a... Um, um, uh, okay, so I'll just step back a moment. So with my workplace health and safety hat on, we um, um, did a trawl through um, our work health and safety help desk um, people's narratives on concerns and um, notifications and there was very little reference to disability, some things, for instance, around um, disability toilets um, and, and, of course, bullying and harassment, which applies across the board potentially to any anyone. So we were not in, in that um, trawl through of the script. There was not um, a, a, definitely not a, a large number of anything relating to disability in that. We don't collect a person's disability status when they call to notify or someone has a concern just meeting our um, privacy obligations there. Um, in the in my role as a um, workers' compensation, um, I think um, one of the things that's referred to on the Public Service Commission's website is some research by Grafham et al. Um, 2002 that says that um, there, you know, that it's trying to dispel a myth that people with a disability are caused injury in the workplace. From a work workers' compensation perspective, um, sorry, I'll speak a bit more slowly. Um, it's it's when there is an injury that there's an issue around premium, for instance. So it's not the fact that someone has employed someone with a disability, it's actually the injuries. And we're not seeing a theme of people with a disability being injured uh, to an extent that, um, you know, it, it's significant. In our jurisdiction, which I remind, I guess, is only 230 employers, 220, that sort of number, who are Commonwealth departments and agencies um, or um, 
40 self-insured um, licensees. If you say that 19 years ago there has been research in effect seeking to debunk the myth that having a disability means that you pose a possible work health and safety risk, do you have a view why that myth seems to continue and to be part of the reasons why employers are reluctant to employ people with disability. And, Ms. Speakers, I'll invite you to respond to that as well because you've, you're very close to the research done as part of the collaboration project. Do either of you have a view as to why that myth continues to exist? Um, I think that from our jurisdiction, it, um, the, the, um, the, the evidence would be that it's, it, it is a myth. Mr Bradford, sorry, Ms Beekers, did you want to add to that? Oh, yes, Ms Eastman, I just wanted to confer with Ms Weston. Um, it would appear to be a myth, but the research that we've done on employer mobilisation unpacks that further. There's a number of layers to that myth. Um, employers are really seeking an opportunity to share the risk and understanding. So I think in we in that research we outlined six sort of groups of employers and they're at various levels of maturity and understanding, both in terms of what is a health, be it a physical or, or mental health injury or condition, and secondly, what role they can play to provide work accommodation, and thirdly, what it is that the psychosocial safety climate or the climate in which that work and whether or not they, they're perceived or otherwise, myth or otherwise, is fit to support someone. Uh, so I think that there's a few things in that research that has highlighted, um, and I think a few of your other witnesses have conferred that in terms of there's a there are further opportunities around how we support employers practically with that. Mr. Radford, has WorkSafe Victoria collected any data or done any research uh, that indicate that a person with a disability creates a greater health and safety risk in the workplace? No, we don't. I'm not aware that we have any research that would um, support that hypothesis. Um, and in fact, as part of our role, uh, as the workplace injury insurer, uh, a key uh, function of WorkSafe is to engage with employers uh, to support the safe return to work of injured workers. Um, so through that activity, uh, we, we work directly with employers uh, to see the capacity and the capability of an injured worker returning to work, uh, I guess, rather than look through a deficit lens of what are the risks involved, we look at uh, what are the opportunities and what are the benefits? And that's that's a key legislative function of our organisation. So can I ask you about what you say at paragraph 17 of your statement then, where you say WorkSafe considers various issues associated with work-related injury and disability in conducting its work, and this is in your regulator function. And you say this, the OHS, so just to clarify, Victoria hasn't adopted the model law so you have an Occupational Health and Safety Act 2004. That's correct. We might come to the distinctions if it becomes necessary. But you say the Victorian legislation does not include specific provisions about hiring a person with disability, but you make this qualification, I want to understand it. However, both pre-existing or acquired injury and disability may be relevant to the application of its provisions. How is a pre-existing disability relevant to the application of the OHS Act in Victoria? So as, as the Occupational Health and Safety Regulator, uh, we look at the work environment and the systems of work in any workplace, um, and that can extend to if there are people uh, with disability in a workplace that there are appropriate safeguards and controls in place uh, to protect the health, safety and wellbeing of all persons in a workplace. Uh, and You're not comes... say, can I just start, can, can I Please. understand this clarification then? You're not saying having a disability is the risk. Absolutely. You're saying, are you not, that the work circumstances or surroundings may create the risk. Is that what correct. you mean to say? Yes, that, that's entirely correct. And an example might be, 
a person with disability who might have some additional mobility needs. Uh, if we were conducting a workplace inspection, we'd ensure uh, that those, need, those needs were being met, particularly uh, in circumstances around being able to exit uh, a workplace in the event of an emergency. Uh, and so there, that's, so yes. that's more an obligation, is it not, on the employer or whoever operates the business or undertaking to ensure that their environment is safe for a person with disability, not the other way around. Is that right? That's entirely correct, yes. Um, Ms Baxter, can I ask you, does Safe Work have any data or has Safe Work undertaken any research that um, indicate that a person with a disability creates um, greater health and safety risk in the workplace? Uh, no, we do not have any data and we have not, to the best of my knowledge, undertaken any research. If I you clear it. Sorry, Ms Eastman, if I could just add, prior to Safe Work Australia's um, coming into existence, there was a piece of work done by the Australian uh, Safety and Compensation Council in um, 2007, I understand it, which was a review of the evidence um, of the question whether people with a disability are at risk at work. Yes, I referred to that in the I referred to that in the opening on Monday. Yes, but it hasn't been included in any evidence provided by the agency. So, is this something that you'd like to now provide to the Royal Commission? Well, we certainly can, but it's it's not work that was undertaken by Safe Work Australia. It predates well, Safe Work Australia's well, existence. I haven't, in my questions, uh, proposed to ask you about a previous agency or organisation. So uh, can I bring you back to my question, which was focused on what Safe Work Australia has done? And do I take it that Ms Baxter's answer means none? Yes, that's correct, Ms Eastman. Ms Baxter, I want to ask you then about the interaction between work health safety laws and people with disability. And you've addressed this at paragraph 33 and following in your statements. And you tell the Royal Commission employers must comply with both their work health safety duties and the prohibition on discrimination in employment in the Disability Discrimination Act. So WorkSafe Australia doesn't have any particular responsibilities or statutory functions in relation to the Disability Discrimination Act. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Safe Work Australia has no responsibility in those areas. Sorry, Safe Work. Thank you. Uh, so when you say in paragraph 34 there's no general proposition that an employer can refuse to employ a person with a disability because they assess the person with a disability poses a greater work health safety risk in round brackets, whether to themselves or others. On what basis do you make that statement? Uh, so that the basis for that statement uh, is in relation to the work health and safety obligation of the PCBU or employer for, for short, uh, sorry, I beg your pardon, person conducting a business or undertaking or for ease of reference, um, an employer is um, that uh, a person cannot um, refuse to employ a person with a disability um, simply because they assess the person poses a greater WHS risk, whether to can themselves or others. Can you tell and me where, can I just ask you, where in the Work Health and Safety Act does it require a no. Ms. And I'll just use the employer rather than the full word to actually assess that a person with a disability poses a greater work health and safety risk, as opposed to whether the workplace poses a greater work health and safety risk to the person with a disability. Do you understand the distinction? Uh, yes, I do. And um, I might ask Ms Edwards to provide some assistance well, can I ask yeah. you first on this, because this is your statement. So you told the Royal Commission that there's no general proposition on an employer refusing to an employ a person because the employer assesses the person with a disability as posing a risk. And what I want to understand is what is the basis on which you say that an employer would be assessing a person with a disability as posing a risk? 
because I cannot see this in the work health and safety legislation as an obligation on an employer to assess a particular person as a greater risk because they have disability. Yeah, so can uh, you explain so the basis of this statement? Yeah. Sorry, Chair. Yeah, Ms. E Ms Eastman, sorry, if I, if I may. Um, that's a proposition that um, in reading evidence given by other witnesses earlier in the year, we understood was a proposition that some witnesses might be putting. It is not a proposition that we in Safe Work Australia are putting. I'm sorry for the confusion. All right. Wait, who are the other witnesses you're referring to? Uh, I believe it was some of the witness summaries that I read, read in relation to public hearing nine. Gosh, okay. Do you accept that when we are looking at assessing work health and safety risk, the assessment is of the workplace and the risk arising out of the work not an assessment of the person with a particular characteristic. Yes, that is correct, but the employer would need to have regard to uh, workers and that, that process would take place most likely during the consultation that the employer is required to undertake with their workers. Well, can you help, help me understand then what are you saying in paragraph 35 where you tell the Royal Commission that Safe Work Australia does not suggest that employers do not in fact refuse to employ persons with disability because of perceived or actual work health safety risk? What does that mean? There's some double negatives in there. I was going to say, is there a double negative officer within your organisation? <laughs> Most of the um, statements so again, seem to be double, double negative. So, again, Ms Eastman, that's um, paragraph 35 goes towards uh, the understanding that we have uh, gleaned from reading some of the witness statement summaries from Public Hearing 9 as a possible proposition being put, and, and we were simply seeking to clarify that's not a, a proposition that Safe Work Australia in relation to the model work health and safety laws uh, agrees with. Uh, is there anything that we can take from reading this part of your statement that you are suggesting that people with disability themselves inherently pose a risk to work health and safety and that is a factor that an employer should take into account? Ms. Eastman, that is not what we are saying. That is not what I am saying in my statement. When you say at paragraph 37 that Safe Work Australia would not support any approach that lessens or reduces the obligations on employers yes. to ensure the health and safety of underlined all workers at work, in other words... Safe Work Australia does not consider that removing barriers to employment for people with disabilities would be achieved through diminishing work health safety protections to workers more generally. Can I suggest to you that that reads, at least, and I'm very welcome you to correct me if I'm wrong in understanding what you're saying, is that if it came to a choice between managing work health and safety risk and employing a person with a disability, that the work health and safety obligations would trump any obligation to employ a person with disability. Uh, Ms Easton, no, that is not what I am saying in my statement. I am simply trying to communicate the fact that work health and safety is about the work health and safety of all workers in a workplace and others, um, regardless of it, it, it's a, it, regardless of what attributes they bring um, to the workplace, and again, um, we were simply um, trying to put the point that if there were views that somehow work health and safety laws could create a barrier to people remaining in employment, because of course work health and safety laws are only enlivened once. 
uh, that that uh, employment e engagement period takes place. We're simply trying to clarify that we believe that the application of the laws must be the same for all workers and others in a workplace. I might just put this proposition to you, to you so I, I'm sure that I'm clear about what you're saying. Your agency is currently now doing a lot of work in looking at sexual harassment in the workplace. If you assess the risk of sexual harassment in the workplace to be attributed to the fact that somebody is a woman and that might make them more vulnerable to be sexually harassed, that to meet work health and safety obligations, you remove women from the workplace. Because can I put that to you? Because if you apply that to disability, the tenor of what you seem to be saying is that you remove the person with the characteristics to minimise breaching work health and safety obligations. Uh, Do you understand? No, not, a, not at all, Ms Eastman. The proposition that I'm putting is that the obligation is on the employer to do all that is reasonably practicable to ensure the health and safety of all workers and others in the workplace. So you're not saying that meeting work health and safety obligations may require an employer to refuse to employ a person with a disability or to remove that person with a disability from the workplace? You're not saying that, I, are you? I'm not saying that. Right. Thank you for that clarification. One of the functions you have is to develop model uh, codes of practice, is it not? Yes, that's right. And there are about 20 model codes of practice that have been published to date. I think there are more than on that. 24. Yeah. No, 24, I beg your pardon, yes. 24, all right. I think there's 20 on the website. There's no model code dealing with people with disability, is there? No, there is not. And there's no model code dealing with uh, harassment or discrimination, is there? No, there is not. And in terms of the codes that have been published, would you agree that a number of them do touch upon what might be the rights and interests of people with disability? Do you agree with that? Yes, I do. For example, there's a code dealing with noise in the workplace and the risk of noise in terms of hearing loss. And I'm not asking, I don't know if you're familiar with the detail of that code, but I'm just choosing that as one, for example. Are you aware of that code? Uh, yes, I am. I'm and that code, not for example, familiar with it. That, oh, code, that code, for example, sets out the sorts of risks that employers should be alert to to prevent an employee developing hearing loss or injury, a hearing injury. Is that right? Uh, without having a look at the code, um, and I'm, I'm not across the detail of it, um, that would seem to be uh, appropriate, yes, that that would be contained within the code. But the code, for example, does not address the health and safety of a person who comes to the workplace with a hearing loss or may be deaf or hearing impaired. Doesn't deal with matters of that kind. No, it does not. And there's a range of uh, codes that identify risks that employers need to be aware of to avoid injury, but the codes for the most part don't address the risk to a worker with a particular disability that might be occasioned by the injury. And I'm summarising broadly. Yes, that's correct. And if, um, for example, we took the 20 or 24 codes and we did a search of all of them, for how they address workers with disability, would you agree that we might be up to maybe 10 references to people with disability throughout those codes? I don't know, um, but if, if 
I haven't undertaken such a search, so I don't know. Um, but if I may, Miss Eastman, um, we're not, when my understanding is when we talk about people with a disability, this is not an homogenized group of people. There are many, many, many different disabilities that people um, have and experience. Um, it would be very difficult to provide um, guidance on every single disability. Um, it, it just, it, it would be very difficult and one which um, neither I nor my agency, my staff and my agency have sufficient expertise in. We don't, we're not expert in the area of um, people with a disability. And the way that the work health and safety laws operate is they, they go towards addressing the risk in the workplace. Yes, but people with disability of the wide range of disabilities are also workers who may experiencing experience the risk. Is that right? Yes, that's correct, of course. And the Royal Commission has heard today that for some workers with dis disability, not everybody, but some workers with disability require reasonable adjustments to be made to enable them to do their work and also to perform their work safely. You're aware of that? I beg your pardon, I just missed the beginning of your statement, Ms Eastman. Was that in relation to the Disability Discrimination Act? No, I'm just asking about reasonable adjustments before I get to a statutory source. But you would be aware, would you not, that not all but some workers with disability may require an adjustment to be made in their workplace to enable them to perform their work safely? Yes. Are you aware of that? And are you yes, aware, I, I don't know if you followed the evidence earlier today, but employers are at times somewhat confused about what their obligations are in relation to making workplace adjustments. You're mm -hmm. aware of that? I have not been following the evidence today. If I put this proposition to you, if you accept that the making of an adjustment may be a very critical element to ensuring a workers with disability safety in the workplace, that that is the type of matter that directly engages the functions that you have under the Act, that is developing policy and strategy about making workplaces safe, is it not? Thank you, pardon. Ms Eastman, are you talking about reasonable adjustments? Because that's not a concept that exists under the work health and safety, the model work, model work health and safety laws. I know. That's why I'm asking you about it. That if it is, if, if an adjustment is something that would assist workplaces, employers and employees to provide a safe working environment as far as practicable, then clearly the making of an adjustment fits into your responsibilities with respect to policies and strategies to make our workplaces safe. I'm just asking if you agree with that. Uh, yes, but I'll caveat that with if it is reasonably practicable to do so, because that is the concept used in the model work health and safety laws. The so has your agency done any work in uh, examining and understanding the approach taken by Australian employers to make reasonable adjustments in their workplaces to make the workplace safer for workers with disability? No, we have not. Ms Baxter, are you aware of something called the focal point in the Australian government? Have you heard that expression? No, I have not. Are you aware that the Attorney General's Department and the Department of Social Services together constitute the focal point for meeting Australia's obligations under the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities? Uh, no, I'm not familiar with that. I'm, I'm not um, familiar with international conventions um, generally. I'm not, uh, that's not an area that I have expertise in. Do you have any recollection, and those on the panel with you may be able to assist you if you're not sure, of um, safe 
Work Australia being asked to give any advice or be involved in any development of strategies about Australia meeting its obligation under the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities? Uh, certainly not in the time that I've been at Safe Work Australia. I have no recollection of any such advice or approach <laughs> having been made. Ms Baxter or anybody else on the panel, uh, have you had occasion to consider Article 27, for example, of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities? Um, no. No, we have not. Mr Radford, you are in a jurisdiction that has a Charter of Rights, which is yes. based on incorporating a range of international human rights, but not the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And you've said in your statement that as a public authority in Victoria, that WorkSafe Victoria has to have regard to the Charter and relevant human rights in performing its activities. It's paragraph 62 if you need to look at your statement. Yes, that's Can right. you tell us how has a human rights approach influenced the research or strategies undertaken by your agency? So the, be the best way I could describe that, uh, Ms Eastman, is that uh, in developing either legislation or regulation uh, for any Victorian government agency, uh, there is a, um, for want of a better term, a test that must be applied uh, and a statement made uh, either to or by parliamentary council as to whether the proposed legislation or regulation complies with the Victorian Charter of Human Rights. Uh, it, taking, in a sense, the description of what the law requires, can you give the Royal Commission any examples where the impact of the Charter has resulted in a practical measure in relation to occupational health and safety or, or where the Charter has resulted in a change to any proposed legislation or policy touching on work health and safety? I'm not aware of such instances, but I will take that on notice if, if I may, uh, and I will consult with our uh, legislative team and just establish and I'll provide further advice to the Commission, but I'm not aware of any instances. One of the rights in the Charter is a right to privacy, and one of the issues that has arisen throughout the course of this hearing and in the information provided to the Royal Commission is this sort of push-pull tension on employers asking for personal information around a person's disability and the extent to which a person with disability feels safe to disclose or identify as a person with disability. Have the privacy rights in the Charter had any bearing on any work that your agency has done in relation to addressing privacy concerns for people with disability? I think the best way I could answer that is in terms of uh, work that we are trying to do uh, through guidance that we provide uh, primarily to employers uh, around attitudinal change and cultural change. Um, so the um, Victorian Public Sector Commission um, does a regular survey of uh, Victorian public sector employees, as you would expect, an engagement survey, uh, which did bear out what you've just suggested uh, in terms of uh, Victorian public sector employees themselves indicate a reluctance, um, as do their carers, to disclose disability or caring responsibilities uh, with, a, with a, a fear or an apprehension that it could lead to discrimination. Would you accept um, so, this, sorry, okay. can I, would you accept this proposition that if there is a fear of uh, disclosing to your employer that you have a disability, mm. that that's actually telling you quite a lot about the employer and the workplace? And if there is a fear of disclosing information that may be relevant to your work health and safety, that is an issue, is it not, that engages your agency, but also the Commonwealth agencies as well? 
Well, I, I can't speak on behalf of the Commonwealth agencies, uh, Ms. Eastman, but in terms of my agency, uh, the, the survey work conducted by the Victorian Public Sector, Victorian Public Service Commission, certainly informs the work that we have been doing probably primarily through two areas. One is our Work Well program, uh, which is a program where we work with employers and industry around creating mentally healthy workplaces. I do. That's my, if I've got time, that's my next topic that I want to come okay. to, with psychosocial disability. Yes. But I just want to deal with this issue of disclosure yes. because the Royal Commission will need to think about how it addresses these questions of disclosure. And if, in a sense, it's not about who should disclose or not, but it's really about the reflection of an employer understanding its workers and its people, that if the workplace is not sufficiently safe to make that disclosure, hasn't the workplace or the employer got some issues in relation to ensuring safety in the workplace? That's a proposition I'm putting to you and I was interested in from the human rights perspective in Victoria as to whether that had made a difference. Yeah, well, but can I ask if can I ask then Ms. Baxter, is this do you agree that if people are reluctant to disclose a matter that might have a bearing on both the worker and the employer discharging their duties under work health and safety law, that's got to be something that needs to be addressed. Uh, yes, Ms. Eastman, it, it might impact upon the work health and safety, work, work health and safety at a workplace. And um, is this a matter of which there's been any consideration for a code of practice? Uh, no, it's not. Um, Ms Eastman, I might just, if it would assist the Commission, take this opportunity to um, just explain how Safe Work Australia operates. I'll, I'll come back that to that. Ms Baxter, we've got really limited time. You've provided a very comprehensive statement that the Royal Commission can read in terms of the functions. So I just want to focus on these particular issues that arise out of the respective statements. Can I ask Ms Weston and Ms Beekus, in terms of the regulatory role of ComCare, but also the work that ComCare does in the workers' compensation area and the rehabilitation and return to work of employees with disability, is do you see this issue about a working environment that's not safe for people to be able to disclose, to, which may have a bearing on accessing adjustments that would minimise the risk of injury but also create safety is an issue that needs to be addressed? So um, with a regulatory hat on, um, Ms Eastman, the... Um, the employer needs to assess the hazards, look at the risks, um, look at what controls they can put in place, um, and if um, something and consult with staff all through that process. If um, they're not hearing about a particular issue that may have a safety implication, um, that is a potentially a problem for that employer. Um, and of course, the employee has an obligation, as you rightly mentioned at the beginning of your introduction, to also keep themselves and the others around them safe as well. So potentially, yes. In the in the safety, rehabilitation and compensation act side of um, the work we do, um, the person has is temporarily injured and we do end up having a fair bit of information as we go through the process of getting them better and back to work. So I think that you will know what their scenario is. Um, they would have been through medical assessments and so forth. So, so less, less of a problem than in the WHS space, I would say. I, this is a, perhaps a contradiction, is that if you have an injury that you acquire in the course of your work, the obligations to report that injury, the systems to support a worker who uh, has an injury and the support for the worker in rehabilitation and return to work is all about a huge amount of information, is it not, around the worker's disability, what needs to be done to support the worker, the adjustments that may need to be made to facilitate return to work. So they have become injured 
that it cut at that point. But for a worker who comes to the workplace with a pre-existing disability, there can often be very limited information. So you see there's some contradiction in terms of the way in which the information about a worker might be collected and used? Well, a person coming into an organisation, they, they will have had to have had a medical in, the, in my jurisdiction, you know, certainly in departments and agencies, so it's an opportunity there to reveal um, things that may need adjustment. So there, there are opportunities also um, during the recruitment process. Um, there is an opportunity to talk about the reasonable adjustments you might need there. Um, you know, and departments and agencies certainly would have... Um, um, people in the HR team or their manager who, who can help them with adjustments that they need. It may be, though, that someone won't disclose that they have a disability. And, you know, you, you probably, most of, most of the people in my jurisdiction would be looking to have good scores in the state of the service that they are um, a, an inclusive and supportive organisation, you know. So, so that, that is um, a a goal of departments and agencies to do well to encourage that culture of disclosure and sharing of the things that they might need to get themselves going well in the workplace. But there's no funding for Pillar 4 of the research work that you're doing, which is very much directed at this very issue. Is that right? So, um, yes, funding is an issue for the collaborative partnership, but nonetheless, there are opportunities for us to use the knowledge that we have acquired through the collaborative partnership and work into those departments and agencies that are progressing the, the new disability strategy that's coming online. So we certainly are hoping to engage with that process, push it forward. I want to briefly touch on the issue of psychosocial health in the workplace. And as Ms Baxter said, there's lots of different disabilities, but the area of psychosocial disability is an area that receives perhaps increasing attention in workplaces, both in terms of the risk that's imposed to people of acquiring a psychosocial disability because of the way in which they may be treated or the conditions in their work. And Mr Radford WorkSafe Victoria has a specialist psychosocial inspectorate team and that's part of the broader regulatory functions that the inspectorate and the inspectors can go and assess workplaces to identify risk and identify compliance with the Victorian Act. Is it right to understand that the psychosocial inspectorate focuses on monitoring and ensuring compliance with workplace safety laws in relation to psychosocial hazards? And they might be work stressors, occasional hazards, but in effect anything that affects the psychological well-being of workers. Has the um, psychosocial inspectorate team had a lot of work to do in recent times? Uh, yes, it has, um, and to the extent that we are uh, increasing the size of that, uh, the, the, in two elements, I guess, the size of the inspectorate itself but also the inspectorate itself but also our specialist programs team where we're hiring uh, people with clinical experience in psychosocial uh, hazard and prevention of psycho identification and prevention of psychosocial hazards and risks. Go ahead, sorry. Does part of the identification of psychosocial hazards involve looking at what measures employers might take to make, for example, adjustments for workers in the workplace to minimise the risk? Uh, yes, it does. The Including, I guess, on a number of, a number of levels, uh, the guidance that we issue around uh, what we call mentally healthy workplaces, uh, which is guidance around supporting employers uh, and employees uh, to identify potential risks and hazards and to speak up, and then some um, suggested controls uh, to mitigate those risks materialising. Um, and a lot of work uh, that uh, our team has been doing actually relates to interpersonal conflict in the workplace, which is the, the single uh, most significant contributor to workplace mental injury is unresolved workplace conflict, which does include discrimination, harassment, bullying, uh, sexual or gendered uh, harassment or violence. 
Is there a process for the inspectorate or the agency generally to collect data so that you can monitor progress or evaluate any particular measures that might be adopted? Um, again, I might just take that on notice. It's, it's a new unit. The psychosocial unit is a relatively new uh, function. Um, at the moment, the way that we respond um, either, either through a proactive inspection or through what we call a response visit, um, there are certain terms that are captured as part of that, which we can then uh, data mine or analyse, um, but I would need to confirm whether we do have any specific uh, language triggers that, um, that might um, answer the question that you've asked. I'm sorry, I don't have that information at night. Thank at you. Ms Baxter, in November 2020, Safe Work Australia commenced work to develop a model code of practice to support duty holders to manage psychosocial hazards and you've got a draft presently out for consultation. Is that right? Uh, we are very nearly um, at the point of taking the model code of practice to our member body at their next meeting in early December. And at paragraph 48 of your statement, you say your agency notes that focusing on individuals rather than on psychosocial hazards may be problematic and inconsistent with the approach taken to physical hazards. And then you give an example that the model work health and safety laws and guidance address hazardous manual tasks rather than workers with back injuries. But you say for psychological health, it may also perpetuate stigma and prevent workers identifying psychosocial hazards. Um, what does that mean in terms of the approach that you've adopted in developing the proposed code of practice? So if the focus is not on the individuals but on the workplace, I'm just not sure why you say that might be problematic and inconsistent. This is paragraph 48. Yeah, so the draft model code that we're currently developing uh, approach it takes a similar approach to that which we have taken in relation to physical risks. It addresses the psychosocial risks in a workplace, um, noting, of course, that an individual or a person in a workplace could themselves be um, a, a cause of risk or, or hazard. Um, but we're simp I was simply making the point at paragraph 48 that um, as we have with physical haz hazards, we believe the better approach with psychosocial um, issues is to uh, deal with the, um, the the risk that is in that is or may be arising in the workplace and address it that way. In terms of identifying the risk, what work has Safe Work Australia done by way of research to identify psychosocial risks and the approach that you've identified in terms of the comparison to physical hazards? So, Ms Eastman, if um, you'd like me to answer that, I will need to take that on notice to provide specific detail of the work that's been undertaken in the development of the code. Right. Well, can I just draw your attention to paragraph 49? And you describe uh, the work health safety inspectors with experience in uh, assessing risk to psychological health. And then later in that paragraph, you say that the agency is not aware of any formal research on these issues. However, the agency assumes that it should not be, sorry, agency considers that it should not be assumed that a worker with an existing mental health condition, whether disclosed to their employer or not, is more likely to be injured by psychosocial hazards in the workplace. I, I, I just... Can you, if there has been no formal research on the issue, on what basis can the agency suggest that it shouldn't be assumed that a worker with an existing mental health condition won't be more likely to be injured? Again, I'm trying to deal with the double negatives in a lot of your statement. Yeah. Um, Ms Eastman, would it help if Ms Edwards assisted? It would help... I think us, for anyone who can assist us in understanding what this paragraph means. 
so the paragraph is attempting to put to the commission that there that we are not aware of any research that suggests that people with disability especially people who are suffering from um, a mental health condition or some um, psychological disability are more at risk from psychosocial hazards that exist in the workplace and that the employer's obligation is to ensure as far as reasonably practical that all workers in the workplace um, are not exposed to um, risks to their health and safety and, and risks are eliminated as far as reasonably practical or minimised. And so, but to the extent that an employer undertakes the risk assessment and one of the, the intentions behind the code of practice is to provide assistance to employers in, in actually being able to undertake that risk assessment and better understand in their workplace and for the work that is performed in their business or undertaking the sources of psychosocial hazards and therefore what control measures uh, need to be implemented, it may be that the employer identifies a particular source of psychosocial hazard and it may be that for that uh, business, they may identify that particular um, groups of workers might be more vulnerable to uh, psychosocial hazards and would the control measures would need to address those. So, for example, um, young workers might be more vulnerable to um, activities such as bullying or hazing or initiation rituals, which um, are clearly a cause of potential um, psychosocial injury as well as physical injury, or that there might be people from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds who may also be subjected to exclusion or other um, damaging behaviours and an employer having undertaken that risk assessment would need to devise control measures. Equally, if that employees, um, uh, workers with disability, it may be that they identify, again, things to do with bullying, exclusion, um, lack of um, consultation or appropriate consultation. And, and the point of the code of practice is to seek to, uh, to arm employers with a better understanding of identifying psycho psychosocial risks. And one of the outcomes of the Boland Review was that there was a lack of confidence on the part of employers, um, first, potentially a lack of appreciation that they owe as great a duty um, to ensure health and safety for the psychological health as well as the physical health. And that's what this piece of work is seeking to do to better arm employers with the capacity to assess risks for all workers, including workers with disability and other workers who in particular contexts might be vulnerable and therefore to identify and implement control measures that provide those employees with the protections that they are entitled to um, under the Work Health and Safety Act. Um, but and it's, the case, it's, in terms it's, of the, it's the case, isn't it? And this is what I'm really getting at, and I'm sorry if my question was opaque. The agency is not aware of any formal research on these issues. That's the case, isn't it? Yes. So if, and, oh, sorry. So if, if, can, it, if there is no formal yes. research on the issues, you are relying so formal, on assumptions. Just, are you no, not? No, so formal, formal research on whether or not employees with psychosocial um, disabilities are more vulnerable to psychosocial, yes. uh, to suffering injury, we are not aware of any research on that issue. And, and the one, of the, one of the tasks... That, one of the tasks of the agency is to undertake research, is it not? Yes. Yes, yes that is one of the functions of Safe Work Australia. And one might assume that before the agency was to develop a code of conduct or a code of practice, 
that it would have undertaken research rather than rely on assumptions. Would you agree? Um, Ms Eastman, our work program is directed by WHS ministers and our members. We were tasked with developing the model code of practice. We work with a group, the a strategy group, the mental health strategy group, who's made up of experts and our jurisdictional partners, social partners and our industry representatives. So it's not that the agency is working alone and has just decided to do the model code of practice without any understanding. We have commissioned um, experts, but have we done specific research on this issue, no, but that's not the focus of the model code of practice. We were simply making an observation that inspectors um, have the view that people with existing mental health conditions may actually present a, a lesser risk in a workplace. And so employers should not be wary of engaging people with a mental health risk, making a claim that they're more likely to be susceptible to mental health injury. That was simply what we're saying. But the model code of practice does not, it goes to control measures for dealing with mental health conditions. And we didn't need to do research on this particular point. Right. Has there been consultation with any of the disability representative organisations, specifically those with expertise in psychosocial health? My understanding is yes, but we can take that on notice to provide you with more detail of that consultation, but there definitely has been um, extensive consultation. We've engaged with the Commonwealth there, um, and the no, I'm asking you, not. I'm not asking you about everybody who you've consulted with, but with a disability I, I, representative organisation. And I said yes, that I think we have, and I can provide you with more notice, um, more Thank detail you. of that. Right. Um, I wanted to uh, ask you about vulnerable workers, but I might leave that topic, Commissioners. It, it's addressed in some detail in the statement. The final issue that I want to deal with before I ask the Commissioners if they have any questions is coming to the other end, which is the workers' compensation end and the support for workers returning to work after a period of illness or injury is... When you're thinking about that workers' compensation model and the programs for return to work, do the agencies, and this is Comcare and Victoria, see this as a form of reasonable adjustment for a worker who may have a temporary disability? Or do you approach the program and planning for return to work in a different way? Mr Radford, maybe I'll ask you to go first. Yes, certainly. Um, so in terms of the return to work program, we would approach that according to the specific needs of the injured worker that we are trying to return to work. Um, and so we do have um, compliance codes which are enforceable, uh, which do require an employer to consider um, either uh, reasonable adjustments, um, workplace or workstation adjustments, or a suitable alternative to allow the safe return to work of that injured worker. An employer in Victoria must um, hold an injured person's um, position open for 12 months and must um, consider and work with uh, ourselves, the injured worker, and most importantly, the injured workers treating uh, providers on modified work and appropriate and suitable return to work. Um, so we do look at it through the lens of a tailored program for the injured, the individual injured worker. Um, but in doing so, um, and whilst it's not part of our legislative role, um, helping educate um, employers and workplaces more broadly of the benefits of returning a person with an injury, either temporary or it can be an, an ongoing disability with a, a severe workplace injury, particularly if it's a spinal injury, um, the benefits uh, of creating that culture of inclusion um, and accessibility. So we certainly do look at those issues, but our remit uh, and our legislation requires us to tailor the specific program to the individual injured worker. That's a fairly significant investment, is it not, in a particular worker in terms of rehabilitation and return to work? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And, and it involves their treating physicians, it involves rehabilitation providers, uh, and it can involve uh, the costs of modifications that are required as well. Okay. Ms. Which, Preston, which are, Ms. All, all of those services, uh, by and large, are funded by our scheme. 
Ms Weston and Ms Beaker said a similar approach in terms of ComCare and workers in the Australian Public Service and the broader agencies captured uh, by ComCare. Ms Weston, we've lost your sound. I beg your pardon. Thank you. Um, the um, under the safety rehabilitation and compensation scheme, it's the um, the rehabilitation authority is the employer. So Comcare will support the employer, the department or agency, or one of the self insured licensees when they do their their role to um, uh, you know to help them. But the their role is to do those activities we talked a little bit about before, um, which are you know having a rehab case manager getting the medical advice about what um, what assistance might be needed, allied health for the physiotherapy. And, of course, a, a workplace rehabilitation provider if expert advice is needed. Um, Comcare um, approves those workplace rehabilitation providers um, in that scheme. So, uh, yes, the, the, the Act talks about reasonable steps to provide suitable duties um, as the obligation on the employer so similar sort of words, reasonable steps, you know, um, compared to your words, I think, which were reasonable adjustments. And uh, and that's also a significant investment, is it not? Uh, yes, the, that is an investment that, um, um, similar to um, Mr Radford's scheme, it falls on the, um, the scheme, the costs of the rehabilitation. Thank you. Ms Baxter, one final question which I omitted to ask you earlier. You tell the Royal Commission at paragraph 13 that there are 15 Safe Work Australia members. That includes the chair and representatives nominated by the Commonwealth, each of the states and territories, two members representing the interests of workers and two the interests of employer together with yourself. Are any of the members um, identified in this group people with disability? Um, I'm not aware of any of the other members, um, but but I have identified as having a disability, but I'm no, I have no knowledge of whether any of the other members of Safe Work Australia have a disability. And there's no requirement, is there, in terms of the membership of Safe Work Australia for it to include a person with disability, is there? No, there is no requirement under the Safe Work Australia Act for that to occur, for that to be the case. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioners. <coughs> Thank you, uh, Ms Eastman. Um, on this occasion, I'll ask the Chair if he has any questions, the answer to which is yes, he does. So, uh, Mr Radford, what yes. is the relationship between Work Safe Victoria and the Accident Compensation Commission in Victoria? Uh, we, um, we don't have an Accident Compensation Commission, uh, Commissioner. We, there's an accident, uh, there's a conciliation service uh, which is a what work safe, work safe as Victoria has taken over the functions that used to be performed by the accident compensation. I beg your pardon. Yes, that's correct. Yes, we are we are now the regulator and the workplace injury insurer in the one authority. Yes, well, I happen to chair the accident compensation commission in Victoria from 1985 to 1989. You've probably taken down my photo. However, one of the things that I learned was that getting injured workers or workers who are off on workers' compensation through, il in, uh, through il illness was an extraordinarily difficult and complex undertaking. In those days, there was no Disability Discrimination Act. There is now. What is the difference between what you have just described, which as I understood it, was a, an affirmative obligation on employers to provide reasonable adjustments or adjustments for a worker that the authority is trying to get back to work. What's the difference between that and the requirements of the DDO? Uh, I'm not. I'm not expert in the Disability Discrimination Act um, or the requirements, but I, from my understanding, they are the the, the notion of reasonable adjustment is similar, um, and the steps that that would be involved are similar. Our role is to fund the provision of those services. Um, and that is that is what we uh, what we do. We coordinate and fund the provision of the services um, to enable the safe return to work and the return to safe work of the injured worker. 
isn't there a very close relationship between the requirements of the Disability Discrimination Act, which incorporate the concept of reasonable adjustments defined in a particular way? Isn't there a very close relationship between that and the employer's obligation to take somebody back to work and to provide the assistance that that person needs to resume employment and thus reduce the costs of workers' compensation? Um, I, I don't believe I'm in, I'm in a position to answer that with any authority, uh, Commissioner, because I'm not I'm not familiar with with the the detail of, of the disability discrimination legislation. I'm sorry, I'm, I, I can take it on notice, but I don't. I don't feel that I'm adequately uh, experienced to be able to answer that now. Thank you. Ms Weston, what's your position on that? I also don't have uh, expertise in the Disability Discrimination Act, but I would expect that there will be some, if not, you know, a significant crossover between what you need to do to get a person back to work and, um, um, and a reasonable adjustment that may be required at a point in time for someone with a disability. Yes, I would have thought that too. And that's why I would have thought that the agencies would be intimately familiar with the requirements of the Disability Discrimination Act, if not the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. But anyway, thank you very much for the answers. Commissioner Galbally, do you have a question? And um, just to follow up on that question, that it's really quite striking to me the difference um, in the effort that's put in to workplaces um, once someone's injured and acquires a disability that way, compared with people who come with disability where they did, their disability wasn't acquired that way. And I'm interested in how, in the best of all worlds, Safe Work Australia for example, would, would ex expand their remit to include that perspective and Comcare and um, Victorian WorkSafe. So Safe Work Australia, how would you expand to include that? Because already the mental health area, psychosocial you're dealing with, why not other disabilities? Um, so predominantly, just using the example of psychosocial, the, the way that we categorise it here in Safe Work Australia is that that is a risk or a hazard rather than an attribute of someone. So the approach in work health, in the model work health and safety laws is to um, eliminate as far as possible um, hazards that may be risks to health and safety. Um, it would be, and something I have not thought about, an interesting um, policy diversion, I think, for work health and safety laws to address the issue of focusing attention on a person who comes into a workplace with a disability. And I think there would be many considerations such as um, implications of privacy legislation, um, th there may be implications in terms of um, the discrimination, disability discrimination legislation. Um, it would certainly be something that we would need to undertake further exploration of um, in order to um, look at and address the anomaly that you've identified. Ms. Weston? In the work, in workers' compensation um, area, um, as we've outlined, there have been, um, uh, you know, there are resources that are paid for by the um, the scheme, the workers' compensation scheme, to get a person back to um, back to health. Um, that relationship is different because you know the person's been injured in the workplace um, with. The relationship of someone who's coming on board. But that said, in my jurisdiction, which as I've mentioned is government departments and agencies and some of the big uh, national companies or organisations, there would be people in those organisations who do who do provide support and resources for someone coming into an organisation. I don't regulate that or, you know, it, I am an employer who does that, but, you know, um, that's that part, um, but I can see in my jurisdiction people who do put resources into reasonable adjustments 
um, and and settling a person with a disability into the organisation. Thank you. Commissioner Wright, I don't have any questions. No, I don't have any questions. Very good. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, I was sorry. Someone want to say something? No. Um, I'll assume that there are no questions to be asked of the panel from uh, legal representatives, in which case uh, I thank the members of the panel from each of the organisations represented today for coming to the Commission to give evidence and for those who provided statements, we thank you for the statements that have been provided. We appreciate the assistance that you have given to the Royal Commission. Thank you. Do we now take a break for 15 minutes? We'll take minutes? a break. I'll do the tender of all of the evidence at the end of the day, just we're running yeah. a little behind time. So if we yeah. could have a break of 10 minutes. We'll make it 12 and resume at, uh, what are we, 3.35. Thank you, Chair. The Royal Commission is adjourned. The Royal Commission is resumed. <laughs> yes, Ms. Dowson. Thank you, Chair. For the final panel of this afternoon, we will be continuing the theme of work health and safety. This time we'll be looking at it from the employer perspective through the evidence of witnesses from Australia Post and Lendlease. Now, I understand that there are some appearances to be announced. Is that correct? Is there an appearance for Lendlease? Apparently not. Is there an appearance for Australia Post? Yes, Commissioner, may I please the Commissioner, Commissioner Woodbury Initial S from Ashurst Lawyers. I appear on behalf of Ms Davies and Australia Post. Yes, thank you very much. And Michael, had someone from Lendlease appear a second ago. Yes, thank you, Ms Nelson. Chair, I'm informed that there was an appearance for Lendlease. They were just on mute. May it please... Uh, Commissioner, I beg your pardon, we were still muted, I think. Uh, T-H-E-W, initial P of counsel, instructed by Herbert Smith Freehills for Lend-Lease. Yes, thank you very much, Ms. Hewitt. Yes. Thank you. If I could now introduce the witnesses, uh, beginning with you, Ms Davies. You are Susan Davies, Executive General Manager, People and Culture at Australia Post. That's correct. And you have prepared a statement for this Royal Commission? That's correct. And it is an undated statement, but it runs to some 17 pages and then a series of annexures. That's correct. And are the contents of that statement true and correct? Yes, they are. Now, as, she as Ms Eastman indicated in her opening on Monday, Australia Post's HR system records that it has 3.91% of its employees are people who identify as a person with a disability. Um, yes, I, if I can just update um, on that number, Council, please. The... Um, the number who have identified in the HR system is, is 1464. We have an additional 771 people who identified through the engagement survey. So um, the, the overall number is 2,235, which is a representation of 5.9. So the 771 in the census, they are additional rather yes. than 771. That's correct. Thank you. Now, Australia Post's participation rate uh, is higher than, or it's the highest of the private sector employers that we're hearing from in this week of hearings. And I was interested in what you thought might be the reason for that. Is it attributable to Australia Post's origins in the public service, or is it because of something that you've done some process or policy you've adopted since becoming a statutory authority or a government business enterprise? I think that there's, it's probably um, uh, two part um, and I think it's it's both of those things. Um, I think that we've we've done a lot of work um, in, in the past four or five years around accessibility and, and inclusion. 
Um, and as you can see in the submission, um, I think following on from the, the, the willing to, to work report, we, we really took some serious actions um, around, and, and again, all, all detailed in the, uh, in the actual submission, but um, we've, we've actually had an accessibility and an inclusion plan um, from 2015. Um, but I think in the past three, four years, um, we really focused on a lot of actions, um, you know, in, in the recruitment process. So things to improve the uh, recruitment process, to, so to attract people into Australia Post. Um, we've Thank you, Ms Davis. I'll, I'll, I'll stop you there because we, we do have limited time. Okay. Just one thing on your statistics, Australia Post doesn't have a target for participation rate for people with disability, that's correct? It, that is correct. Do you think you should? So up until last year, we've had a, a, a target for uh, disability, and I think that targets play a really important part. They, they have a role to play dependent on the, you know, what part of the journey you are on as an organisation. Um, and we felt that this year for the first time, uh, we removed that target and our focus is very much more around leadership and culture and uh, a, a, a workplace that is, is very uh, accepting um, of, of, of disability. And, and you know, we, we really want to change the culture and the leadership rather than focus on targets. Thank you. Turning to you now, Ms. Stewart, you are Melinda Stewart. That's correct. And you're the Acting Chief People Officer Australia and the Group Head of People Connect at Lendlease? Yes, that's correct. And you made a statement for the Royal Commission dated the 3rd of November 2021? Yes. And in that statement, you referred to and adopted an earlier statement of Ms. Megan Davis dated the 15th of June, 2021. Yes. And taken together, are those statements true and correct? Yes, they are. And as to lend leases participation rate, as at the 1st of November, 2021, your HR system recorded eight employees. That is correct, of the employees who self-disclosed where they have a disability. In the HR system? In the HR system, correct. And that, sorry, that equates to 0.17% of your workforce? That is correct, of the people who chose to self-disclose in the HR system, yes. And you also conduct a biannual survey of your employees? Yes, we completed a survey in May that is referenced in our submission where we had 38 employees disclose that they have a disability, which equated to 1.26% of our employee participation. And, and our most recent survey data that we didn't have at the time of our submission on the 3rd of November, we had 48 employees who disclosed that they have a disability, uh, representing 1.63% of those who participated in the people survey. And you say in your statement that you don't have a target for the employment of people with disabilities, but lend is instead focused on removing barriers to employment. Yes. Based upon your participation numbers, that approach doesn't appear to be working. Do you accept that lend could and should do more in this area? Lendlease actually does quite significant work to support all of our employees uh, in the workforce. Whether they choose to disclose uh, is, is purely at their discretion. Uh, we do not require it as a, as a, a mandatory component of reporting. Um, and, in fact, I have a very fantastic example of a gentleman who recently competed in the Tokyo Paralympics and is a member of the employee a member of staff at Lendlease, and he has not actually self-disclosed in our HR system that he has a disability, but he actively participates in, in conversations about his disability and representation for Australia. So I would say that although the reporting rate perhaps is low, uh, we know that you know, we understand that more people with disabilities no doubt work for Lendlease, 
but trying to remove the barriers is what we're focusing on as opposed to uh, setting targets for uh, people with disabilities in our employment. I understand that there's a difference between reporting in the HR system and um, anonymous disclosure through censuses and surveys. Do you have reason to believe that Lend-Lease's number is in fact higher than the 48% anonymously disclosed in your most recent, 48 people anonymously disclosed in your most recent survey? I don't have any hard facts or data that would suggest that that is the case. Um, I could only rely on uh, information, I guess, that's that's publicly available um, for you know, broad uh, participation uh, in, in the public, but all, all I can rely on is, is the data that we have reported at this time. Thank you. Moving now to the focus of this afternoon's panel, which, uh, as I said by way of introduction, is work, health and safety. If I could invite you, Ms Stewart, to tell the Royal Commission about Lend-Lease's um, how you think about culture and safety in terms um, of your workforce generally and if there's a difference then in terms of your employees with disability? Health and safety is uh, a guiding principle of Lend-Lease. We have four, so customer focus, diversity, inclusion, health and safety and sustainability. So um, you know, safety is of paramount focus. We know that our people can go to work and, and there is a very real risk in some instances um, that they could be harmed. So our biggest focus is to ensure that everybody gets to return home safely each day from work. Um, we certainly do not have any uh, in indication or reporting that people with disabilities are treated any differently. Uh, and, in fact, we very much focus on a diverse and inclusive workplace for all. Um, work health and safety is, as I said, you know, a, a significantly important component of what we do each and every day. Uh, and this is evidenced through uh, what we refer to as our global minimum requirements, which is a minimum requirement for um, environment, health and safety for all of our projects and assets to operate to uh, globally, not just here in Australia. And that starts right from the bid phase of a project right through the delivery phase. And they're very prescriptive around um, how to mitigate risks and controls in the organisation and the delivery of a project. And there is absolutely no uh, differentiation for how that applies to employees with or without disability. What steps does Lend Lease take to ensure that it meets its primary duty of care in respect of employees with disability? Uh, our employees, I guess, if they choose to disclose that they have a disability and require accessibility adjustments in the workplace, then we will um, accommodate those through our workplace support program. We have an uh, in-house team of injury care and recovery managers, uh, team four, who will work very closely with those employees should they require adjustments. Um, and the same team also then works uh, with any employees who sustain work-related or non-work-related injuries or illnesses in how they are, are able to be accommodated to perform their work or return to work. Um, this team, along with our uh, environment, health and safety team, um, also ensure full compliance um, with all work health and safety reg regulations and obligations. Thank you. So returning to you now, Ms Davis, could you please explain to the Royal Commission how Australia Post thinks about its culture of safety and risk? So Australia Post, it's, it's actually one of Australia Post's core values. Um, so safety is at the heart of everything we do. Um, we, we believe that safety starts at the top. We believe that you need to uh, walk the walk. Um, and so it is a, a very um, significant thing that we focus on at board level, at executive level. Um, we have a clear straight safety strategy. Um, a, a big part of that strategy is mental health focus as, as well, which is um, psychological injury and, um, and, and physical injury, are both equally as important. 
We have um, clear policies. We operate um, under the uh, Commonwealth, um, uh, the uh, SRCC, the, the, under the Commonwealth for Com Care legislation. So, um, yeah, as well as, as our obligations around state and federal le legislation, um, we are um, very uh, heavily audited and, and linked with uh, Com Care in, our, in the expectations and and regulations, but I think more than anything, we are very clear on what we expect from our leaders um, in keeping uh, a safe workplace and keeping our people safe. And we've got clear roles and regulations, rules and regulations around what we expect, expect from all our employees as well. So we expect that people will, will come, uh, come to work in the morning and that we'll, they'll go home in the same state that they came to work. That's really important to us. Um, so we, we have a very, very clear vision and strategy of our expectations. And to what extent is the strict liability that exists in workplace health and safety legislation a motivating factor in the development of that culture you've described? It's essential. Um, I think the... But, excuse me, if I can interrupt there. Do, by essential, does that mean... You have developed your, your policy, your culture, specifically in response to the strict liability. No, quite the opposite. So we, we believe that if we, uh, for keeping our, our employees safe is, is a basic requirement for us. We don't do that because it's a, a, it's a legal obligation that, that we have to do. We obviously comply with all our legal, legal obligations, but... Um, you know, what if our core value is, is that we, we've got four core, core values, trust, inclusivity and empowerment and safety, not in any specific order. But, um, you know, you, if, if, you, if you're willing to keep people safe, then you'll build on trust. Um, and if you build on trust, then you build a, a good culture in an organisation. And I think over the years, we've, we've managed to build that trust in an organisation. We've gone through transformation. We've been around for 216 years. Um, we've, we've got people that have been around. It's very, very normal in our organisation to see a tenure of 20, 30, 40 years. So, um, you know, I, I think you've got to continuously revisit, um, you know, every, everyday safety and, and, and have it absolutely underpin everything that you do. And I, I don't know if either of you have been following the evidence of the Royal Commission, but one of the themes that we were hearing in the evidence is this question of a perception of risk, that employees or people with disability are perceived to pose a greater risk in the workplace. And what I want to ask you both, but I'll begin with you, Ms Stewart, is how you go about identifying and measuring risk in the workplace. What do you look to to identify your risks? Um, as I outlined, Ms Dassett, uh, the, the global minimum requirements that Lendlease has really, I guess, helped to govern and guide how we identify risks and uh, implement controls. So that's, a, that's a, a, a very broad program that has been in place for many years, has recently uh, been updated. We conduct um, regular training for all of our employees, uh, mandatory training for compliance with uh, the global minimum requirements. Uh, and before each job or task is, is undertaken, especially in more high-risk areas, um, uh, there, is a, there is an assessment of the work to be performed and an assessment of the risks and, and the controls that then need to be put in to mitigate those risks. Uh, it's very clearly outlined in our, in our um, documentation. Do you have a process for reporting accidents, injuries and near misses? Yes, we do. We have uh, a very robust uh, process through our environment, health and safety team. Uh, we record um, incidents in a system called Enablon uh, and those safety statistics are regularly reviewed and reported up to our senior leadership teams and we also disclose information through our annual reports. In that reporting process, is it a requirement to identify contributing or potential contributing factors? Uh, should there be a safety incident or near miss and there's an investigation that is completed 
uh, with the environment, health and safety team in the, in the first instance in conjunction with the business. Um, absolutely, there'll be un understanding what are, the, what are the factors that have contributed, what are the causes um, to, to determine, especially what can be done to prevent further injuries and incidents from happening again. And is it the case that if there was an, an accident or a near miss and one of these investigations was completed and it was thought that a particular factor contributed, it would be captured and then that would be analysed? Yes, that is correct. And so from your own data, what can you tell the Royal Commission about whether, if at all, and if so, how much, employees with disabilities feature in these accident and near-miss reports? Now, so we don't actually record the status, the disability status of a worker involved in an incident or a near-miss. And, in fact, I've, I've confirmed this earlier today, uh, we do not record or even um, ask that in the line of investigation as to whether the person has a disability. And can we draw from that... That's because it's lend -Lease's view that that would never be a relevant factor. Yes, that is correct. Thank you. If I could turn to you, Ms Davies, and ask that same question, um, beginning with what does Australia Post do to identify and measure risk? So the two, two levels of, of risk. So obviously critical risk within the workplace is, is a, an absolute focus for us. And um, I think like every, every workplace, we, uh, we have risk. And um, uh, I think the, you know, that, that, that is, a, again, a major part of our overall safety strategy. Um, we have a, a safety index so as part of that safety index, we report on a weekly basis things like near misses and, you know, safety walks and lots of different things within that index. We, we have a, a safety council of which three, uh, two board members and the chairman sit on. Um, and we, we hold that council um, on a regular basis. And these are the numbers that we look at um, at, at board level. Um, we also report um, in the board on these things. Individual risk, um, as we bring that down to um, every employee, so we've got workplace risk, we've got individual risk. So every employee that joins Australia Post um, we do individual risk assessments. So everyone who joins the organisation would go through a, uh, uh, a medical. We, we do risk assessment of roles. Um, and, you know, for example, one of the, the core roles in Australia Post is, is the postman's role. Um, and, you know, there's, there's, there's risks out there every day with, um, with motorbikes and, and dog bites. And uh, so we, we do a lot of things around risk assessment of roles and, and obviously um, the assessment for the capability of someone to do that role. Uh, could you just explain to the Royal Commission why that medical assessment is necessary for every employee coming into Australia Post? Of course. So the every role, we, we've got lots of different roles. We're obviously a, a very much a frontline um, organisation. So um, the, the bulk of our employees sit um, within that, that frontline area. So... Um, again, I'll use an example of um, a, a, a posty role. Um, you know, one of the, the key things there is that we would um, we would expect that first of all they they had a, a motorbike license. That's that's sort of a, an inherent requirement of the role. Um, you know, but we've got we've got weight restrictions on on motorbikes. Um, you know, somebody. Uh, who is at 100 kilos can't ride a motorbike because that's not safe to do so. So we we that's that's the reason we again we just want people to be safe and we want to make sure we have things like uh, lifting restrictions. So you know if if you're coming into one of our facilities, then you're, you're sort of lifting small parcels and packets. We need to be able to make sure that ergonomically people can bend and lift properly and, and they can actually lift to 16 kilos. So throughout that whole process, um, if you were new in the organisation coming through the recruitment process, 
you can either flag in the recruitment stages, uh, three, three, three stages in, in recruitment. You can actually flag that you have a, uh, a disability or you need a, an adjustment, a, a reasonable adjustment within the actual recruitment process. Um, or that you need an actual um, a, a workplace adjustment once you're actually in the role. So you could have someone flagging that before they go into the role, during the process, or actually when they're in the, they're in the role as well. So it's, it's an important thing to us. So that's the flagging of an adjustment. And perhaps the person says, I have a lifting restriction or I can't ride a motorbike. I'm not sure how that links to a need for a medical assessment. Um, some, surely some of your postal delivery people are, are walking people or they drive cars rather than motorbikes. I just don't understand how that explanation for why everybody has to have a medical assessment. I think it goes back to um, everyone being safe within our, our workplace. Um, yeah, you know, the the end of the day, you know, we want people to, as I say, go home in the same condition as they kept, they come to work, and it's really important, even with a postie who's on a walking round, for example, um, you know, they they cover some some fair kilometres in in a day, so we need to make sure that people are able to um, to do the, the 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 role that they're actually applying for, you know, someone who's applying for. Um, a, a line a line haul driver's role. Um, you know, again, we need to make sure that um, that they're that they're fit and able to do that. And of course, if there's anything raised in in the process, then you know, at any stage in that process, then we do look for um, you know either workplace adjustments. So if somebody comes in and said, you know, I really uh, want to to be um, a, a postie and I want to drive a motorbike, um, I've got a, po- a license, but um, 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 maybe I, I have a weight restriction or, or, or a weight issue, then we would actually look for alternative employment within that process and we'd actually support that person to achieve um, the ultimate role that they wanted to be in. Um, but, you know, going back to your original question, we, we want to make sure that, you know, everyone who comes into the organisation, that, that, you know, that they're able to, to uh, we can put them in a safe environment and they can, they can operate in a safe environment. So are you putting the onus, as Australia Post, putting the onus on the person to fit safely into your framework rather than finding a way for Australia Post to safely accommodate them? I think it's the form, uh, the um, the latter, not the former. We, um, you know, we we do expect that that um, you know there are certain requirements for certain roles, um, you know, and that that's quite straightforward. And you know, you can't you can't if you if you can't lift, you can't you know you can't lift up to sixteen kilos. Then it would be extremely irresponsible of, of us to put people into roles where we know that people have to lift up to sixteen kilos each day. So, um, but Can't we don't you just expect- ask them that. Do you need to send them to a medical assessment for that? Well, I think we look. We we ask people. We ask people in the in the process, and you know, people will tell us honestly. Yes, they. Not everyone discloses within the process. Um, you know, a lot of people do disclose in the process, and that's the culture that we want to. Uh, you know, we, we want everyone to uh, to experience, but not everyone will declare in that process. Um, you know, whether whether they they do they've had a long they've got a long standing injury or you know they've got they've got any issues. So, you know, I think it's it's a it's a, it's not a safeguard for the organisation. It's it's more a you know the the employee. We want to make sure that that individual um, is is able to one do the role. And, and again, you know, let me use a different example. We have a, a lot of drivers in in our business, so um, you know we 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 see a lot of of drivers coming into our business where. You know, in, they're pulling curtain ciders back for 20, 30 years, then, you know, they're suffering from 
um, shoulder issues, recon shoulder reconstruction. So, you know, the, these are a lot of the things that we deal with. And it's not to say that we, we don't employ people. We do absolutely employ people. But we would rather recognise the adjustment requirements up front than have someone come into our workplace and, and be, be, you know, injure themselves. And, and then, you know, we're, we're talking about rehabilitating someone in the workplace or, or worse. So we, we take it really seriously. You have addressed in your statement um, employment adjustments, which I think you've just been touching on, and you, you do it in, by contrasting work-related injuries and non-work-related injuries. Is it fair to say that Australia Post takes a different approach depending upon the source of the injury? Not, not in the workplace adjustment. Obviously, a workplace um, injury, a work-related injury um, is, is subject to, uh, as I mentioned earlier on, the Commonwealth Comcare legislation, and uh, we're obviously um, um, part of that. So, um, you know, we're, we're a big organisation with 37,000 employees. So we, we have a, a, a team of people who deal with um, the, the whole start to end of any workplace injuries. So that is from, that's early intervention, that's, that's rehab, it's the process of the workers' comp claim and uh, through to the completion. And one of the key things that we focus on is returning people back to work as soon as we possibly can. Um, if it's a non-work related injury, then that would come through um, in, in different ways. It's not that we, we deal with people in, in helping people get back to work with the uh, restrictions. It's, it's more around the way that that would actually come through to us. So, again, let's use an example where... Well, perhaps I'll, I'll cut you off there. Um, we are, we are, have a very tight time and there are a few understand. specific issues that I want to come to. So do you have your statement in front of you? I do. If you could turn to page seven, this is where you begin with your workplace adjust employment adjustments. And about halfway down the page, there's a heading that says employees. Yeah. And then you refer to an employee who presents with workplace restrictions due to a non-work-related medical condition. Yes. See that? Yes. And then you go on to say um, local management will review the situation and determine whether this request can be accommodated, taking into consideration the safety of the employee. Yes. Uh, am I correct in understanding that that, in broad brush, is how Australia Post responds to non-work-related injuries? Somebody comes in with their restrictions and it's down to local management to consider accommodating those restrictions having regard to safety? Not always. That, that may be one way. The relationship of, of employees is very much at a local level. So an employee may come in and, and uh, speak with a local manager, but they, we also have a, uh, um, a, a central team of people, my HR, where people will um, um, come to as well and say, you know, and it, it, it's not always an injury. Um, you know, sometimes it's that someone as uh, someone who's been with us 20 years, it's not that they came in with an injury, but, you know, or, or an illness that's now classed as a disability. But, you know, and, and we've had a number of people where, for example, they, they've, they've got MS and so they'll have a local conversation with the manager. The manager will then generally um, raise that um, at, a, at a central level or it will come direct to a central level. And we will look for reasonable um, adjustments in, in the workplace for that individual and we'll make sure um, that, that we can accommodate that individual. And the size of our organisation generally lets us always um, you, you know um, support workplace adjustments in those situations so we don't deal with people differently in the outcome but obviously if it's an injury at work we're dealing with that way up front when the injury happens. So still on that page there is a heading right at the bottom of the page injuries sustained whilst at work. And so then the, the discussion goes over onto page eight. Yes. And 
In the third full paragraph, it begins common employment adjustments include. You see that? Yes. And so you're talking there, if I'm correct, about employment adjustments that are made for people who've sustained workplace injuries. So these are people covered by the Safety, Rehabilitation and Compensation Act scheme that you've been talking about. That relates to in that specific context, but we also do that um, for people who are non-work related injuries who, who come in and say, you know, I, I need to, um, uh, you know, I've injured myself playing football at weekend and I now can't lift for the next four weeks. Can you can you help me support me through the next four weeks? So there's temporary injuries. There's more permanent things like the previous example I used. Um, but, you know, we, we, we don't differentiate in how we support people getting back to work. So the next heading on that page under the paragraph I just directed your attention to is injuries sustained outside work. Yes. And you tell us that those injuries are dealt with within guidelines of Australia Post non-work-related medical restrictions, policies and procedures. Yes. So am I correct in understanding there are two sets of policies, one that relates to compensable injuries, workplace injuries, and one that relates to non-compensable injuries, uh, whether it's a, a short-term, a temporary condition or a... a a long term, a disability, th th those are the two options. It's work related or it's non work related. Yeah, they're, they're quite separate, yes. And is it your evidence to this commission that while there are two sets of policies, the way you treat those employees is the same? Absolutely. So, in relation to work related injuries, you've reported that. 95% of case closures you re Australia Post recorded as attaining pre-injury hours and duties. So that's somebody's gotten completely back to work. Yes. In the remaining 5% is the person on a, a permanently modified role. Yes. In relation to injuries sustained outside work, as I understand it from those two paragraphs at the bottom of page eight, you are saying that in the financial year 2018 to 2019, 26% of employees who were injured outside of work and in the following year, 20% were able to be accommodated within their medical restrictions. Yes. Yes. And so that accommodation that you're talking about, is that that same thing we see in that paragraph, common employment adjustments? That's the same kinds of things people were needing? I think with the injury sustained outside of the workplace, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have all of the detail that we would have on people with injuries sustained within the workplace. So if it's a workplace injury, like I say, we, we, kept, we, we, we are with that individual from the point of, of that injury and we manage, the, we manage the process from start to finish. I think uh, injuries outside of work, well, we, have, we do have rehab providers on site. We have exercise physiologists. We have you know, lots of support, um, but we don't have the level of detail um, in, in the actual injuries. You could ask the employee when they come in and say, I need a request, a workplace adjustment, you could ask them for the supporting information that you need, couldn't you? And, and we would do that. Um, and, you know, we would ask, again, if someone was injured, whether it's in, in work or, or not, as part of that return to work process, um, we, would, we would generally ask for um, a, a doctor's clearance to say this this person is is able to to do this work again that's really important whether that's in um, you know wh whichever policy it's in and then if it's this person can return to work with certain restrictions then um, again whether it's inside or outside of work the injury we actually um, we, we look for alternative work or we, we look for work with restrictions. Thank you. Just one more point on your statement. On page nine, um, you're talking here about adjustments that have not been provided 
and you the discussion all appears under the heading of injuries sustained outside the workplace. Am I then to understand from this evidence that where the injury is sustained within the workplace, where it's compensable, adjustments are always provided? I don't, I don't think, and, and again, to the best of my knowledge, I, I, I don't believe, that, and I don't have the data on the non-work related that I do on the work related. Um, it, is, it is certainly, you know, my understanding, and again, there will be a, a lot that's done locally to support people, but it is certainly, you know, our approach would to be to provide every employee with the level of support um, and the opportunity to return to work as soon as possible because we, we fully understand that, you know, primary injuries can soon result in secondary psychological injuries. And again, that is something that we are extremely focused on. So whether someone was injured inside of work or outside of work, our, our primary focus is to help them get back to work as soon as possible. So is it accurate then to say that from Australia Post perspective, there is no practical difference between the obligation under the Disability Discrimination Act to make reasonable adjustments and the obligation under the SRC Act to take reasonable steps to provide suitable employment to an injured employee? They're obviously two different acts, but the principle of the organisation um, is absolutely, as I've just said, that, that you know, our, our focus is to return that person to work as soon as is possible. That's why I asked about from a practical perspective. I appreciate they are different pieces of legislation with different tests, but I'm talking about in practice, on the ground. Is that what you're telling the Royal Commission? Have I understood your evidence correctly? I believe that we absolutely would not treat people any differently, whether it's a workplace injury or not. It's different legislation and a different process, but um, and we certainly have more detailed reporting around the uh, workplace injuries. But um, no, as a principle, I, I would absolutely say that Australia Post focus is always to return that person back to work. Thank you, Ms Davis. If I could turn to you now, Ms Stewart, in your statement, you have described Lend-Lease's workplace support program. And um, in the detail of that program that you've provided, it says, and this is a message from Lend-Lease to its employees, if you require support to return to work or remain at work safely and productively, then they access that support through the workplace support program. Your statement and that information doesn't distinguish between workplace injuries and other needs for support, whether it's illness or injury or a long-term disability. Am I correct in understanding that from lend perspective, there is no difference in practice in the support you provide? That is correct, Ms Dowsett. Our workplace support program and the injury care and recovery team will support uh, employees that sustain both work and non-work related injuries and illnesses. And other than some of the formal documentation that will need to be completed for workers' compensation claims, uh, the practical application uh, is the same for work and, and non-work related injuries. And so again, I, I, you've already answered it, I think, but just to be clear, in your practical approach for Lend-Lease, you see no difference between the concept of a reasonable adjustment under disability discrimination and providing suitable employment under workers' compensation legislation. You do the same thing to get the person back to work. That is correct. Thank you. Just one moment. I have no further questions. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Galbraith, do you have any questions? Um, I may have misunderstood. Oh, first of all, Ms. Davies, congratulations on, you know, such a high, you know, the highest percentage. Um, but also in coming down a little from 6.3 to 5.7, do you have strategies in place to keep going up, which is, I'm sure, where you want to head? We, we do, Commissioner, and I, I think the, the, the one thing that will change 
perception um, of, of disability in the workplace, in, in our view, is, is that people see ability and, and not disability. And that starts at the top of an organisation and it goes right the way through an organisation in the culture and the leadership. And, and we, we talk about quotas, we talk about targets, um, and I, I will feel that we've succeeded as an organisation when that number is, is up at 10, 18, 20%. And we've done that without focusing on a number. We've done that because people see the ability um, and, and not disability. And I think we're on that journey. Um, and, and the decision that was made this year to move away from a target was all around that. But you'll still be tracking it closely. And we will really track. <laughs> we will be tracking it, tracking it uh, very closely. Yeah. And just to come to the topic of. Um, the difference in workplaces for injured workers um, on, in the workplace compared with um, people injured outside the workplace or indeed disabled. So 26% were able to be accommodated if they were injured outside the workplace compared with 90% if they were injured inside the workplace or am I misunderstanding that, that comparison? Yeah, I think, Commissioner, it's, it's, it's more around we have got, um, we absolutely have a complete record of, of the, uh, the, the, the workplace injuries. So we track every single individual. I think there'd be a lot of local agreement, agreements out in the uh, facilities. And, you know, as, as you know, we, we have hundreds of facilities. We have thousands of post offices. Um, you know, so I think every day um, in our workplace, there are adjustments being made um, for individuals, short term, longer term. Um, but I, I, what I can say is that the principle is absolutely the same in that we believe people are better at work. Thank you. And Ms. Stewart, that, that was your answer too um, about, about the difference between the two groups. So we, we do not differentiate uh, for the, the workplace adjustments or the reporting or statistics. We, we absolutely uh, want to ensure that we have, um, you know, remove any barriers and accommodate adjustments uh, for all of our workers, whether they're injured at work or, or outside. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Ryan. Um, both of you said that you decided to step away from targets. In the case of Lend-Lease, it was to focus on reducing barriers. In the case of Australia Post, it was to focus on leadership and culture. Isn't it just a little bit like deciding not to measure profit and loss, but focus on efficiency and marketing? I mean, some people would find that a bit difficult, that you would uh, not be planning to measure and target to reach a particular direction and work out whether you had succeeded or failed. And that's usually the purpose of a target. Why would you... Why is... Why is um, focusing on reducing barriers and leadership and target, targeting um, uh, leadership and culture, why is that mutually exclusive of having a target? Uh, so, Commissioner, at Lend-Lease, uh, at this stage, we uh, I guess, still on a, on a journey, you would say, as part of our diversity and inclusion plan. We have a number of strategic uh, initiatives that we're intending to implement and pursue over the coming years. Um, targets for disability, um, workers who identify with a disability as part of our employment has, has not been uh, a particular strategy that we have undertaken at this time. We absolutely want to be able to create the workplaces. You know, we build workplaces every day for our clients, for ourselves. Um, we did win an award, you know, a number of years ago now, 2016, for guidelines that we developed in conjunction with the Australian Network on Disability and Westpac for you know, designing um, with dignity. We want to make sure that the workplaces that we build uh, and the workplaces that we operate in can accommodate all people, regardless of their ability or disability. So we don't believe that we need to have targets if we're actually doing uh, more around design that's well beyond compliance um, to provide a, a very inclusive workplace. But the barriers for people with disability working uh, are greater than environmental. There's attitudinal, there's structural and other things. Well, surely a target helps you measure whether or not 
you're succeeding at those. Commissioner, we do record uh, mandatory completion, sorry, completion of mandatory training uh, in both environment, health and safety, diversity and inclusion training. So we absolutely report those statistics internally. Um, and we, uh, you know, we have trained um, 512 of our people to be mental health first aid trained. We have trained 424 of our leaders in Australia, which is 36% of our leaders uh, to be mental health first aid aware as well. To, you know, we, we have a range of uh, initiatives and, and wellbeing programs that we roll out to provide more training and, and awareness for our people, um, again, to support all of their workers, again, without needing to have targets at this time. All right, thank you. Ms Davies, do you want to respond to the initial question, perhaps very briefly, considering the time? I will, uh, Commissioner. And, you know, we, we will always measure, always measure this, this number. I think the, the point is we, we don't want to focus on a number what we want to do is focus on um, the, the culture and the measure of success will, will be in a number, but it, it will be more when people see um, ability and not disability. And um, we, we see the, the absolute advantage um, of, of people in the workforce. Thank you. Uh, I assume that there are no questions from any of the legally represented parties. And on that assumption, I thank both uh, Ms Stewart and Ms Davies for coming to the Royal Commission to give evidence for your statements and the oral evidence you've given today. Um, as with uh, all the other witnesses who have appeared this week, we very much appreciate your assistance on the important issues that we have to examine. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, um, Ms Dowsett, you want to attend to some documents, I assume. I do, Chair. Have you been past the three pages of the list? Yes. We will begin with Safe Work Australia. The statement of Michelle Baxter dated the 3rd of September 2021. We propose be marked Exhibit 19-24 together with annexures 19-24.1 through to 19-24.3. From Safe Work Australia, sorry, WorkSafe Victoria, the statement of Colin Radford, dated 27 October 2021, 19-25, with annexures 19-25.1 through to 19-25.3. The statement of Susan Weston, dated the 3rd of September 2021, 19-26, with annexures 19-26.1, through to 19-26.3. The statement of Natalie Beekus dated the 3rd of September 2021, 19-27, with annexures 19-27.1 through to 19-27.8. The statement of Megan Davies dated Davis dated the 15th of June 2021 will be 19-28 with annexures 19-28.1 through to 19-28.5 and the statement of Melinda Stewart dated the 3rd of November 2021 will be 19-29 and finally the statement of Susan Davies undated will be the 19, will be exhibit 19-30 with a lecture 19-30.1. Yes, thank you. All those uh, documents uh, will be admitted into evidence and given the exhibit numbers uh, to which Ms. Dowsett has referred and I have initialed and dated the document that records uh, those uh, documents being admitted into evidence. Could we very briefly indicate please what is to happen tomorrow? Thank you, Chair. Uh, so tomorrow we'll be beginning with a panel from the Public Service Commissioners, which will take up the morning uh, divided into two sessions, but they will be take you through to lunchtime. Then after the lunch and adjournment, there'll be a panel on building inclusive workplace culture, followed by a panel on legal safeguards addressing discrimination. Thank you very much. All right, well, we'll adjourn until 10 a.m. Eastern Summer Time tomorrow. The Royal Commission is adjourned. <laughs>